Hey y'all, welcome to our Omoplata instructional system. The Omoplata isn't just a powerful submission, it's an effective system for advancing your position and controlling your partner. Over the next couple hours, we're going to show you how to trap your opponent in the Omoplata web and use that to safely finish. I think everybody should learn the Omoplata system for about three reasons. The first, it's really simple, but really high percentage and effective. The second is that it's really good for smaller people, which is what Jiu Jitsu is all about. It allows us to get out from under our opponent without carrying their weight and use our entire body to isolate their entire arm. The third reason is, even if you don't ever make Omoplata your A-game, it's still going to teach you important things about hip movement and about transitioning between positions that's going to make your overall game shine. One detail I want us to focus on is the elbow. Anytime I can flare my partner's elbow, especially if I can make his palm turn the ceiling, maybe I shove his sleeve, the Omoplata is there. That's an entry concept that we're going to work on throughout the DVD. Sometimes this person is going to do it to themselves, like when they're defending a triangle. Other times we're going to force them to do it with our gripping strategy. But just keep that concept in mind and really internalize it. If I can make their elbow go away from their body and flare, and I can make their palm face the ceiling, I can omoplata. One last thing. Every technique has a setup, an entry, and a finish. Over the next couple hours, we're going to give you a ton of setups and entries to the omoplata position, teach you how to finish both using the standard omoplata and some other different techniques that we can get when we have them caught in the position, and we're going to show you counters to the most common counters that people use to defend the omoplata position. I'm really excited to show all of this stuff. Thanks for watching, so let's get started. We're going to start with the basic omoplata from the closed guard and getting what I call the standard omoplata position. Everybody does their grips a little bit differently, and I want to show you why I use the grips I use for my standard control strategy. We're going to return to these grip concepts over and over throughout the instructional, and so I want us to have a nice solid base for why we do the things we do when we do the entries and when we do the finishing techniques. So if I'm in closed guard and Eric is on top. What I need to do is get his elbow away from his body and flare it, and I need to make his palm face the ceiling. I'm going to get a cross collar grip and a sleeve grip. Now I'm either going to step on his hip or just move my own hips out, trying to get the inside of my knee on the back of his shoulder blade. As I do this, I'm going to punch his shoulder back or punch his wrist backward. When this happens, my knee comes up to his shoulder and I'm going to pinch down tight. This is really important to stop my partner from posturing up. When I have the cross collar, it also helps a little bit with posture control. Now I'm going to uncoil my body, bring my leg in front of his face, and now I switch my grips. My collar grip comes to his elbow, and my sleeve grip comes to the back of his pants, gripping right on top of his pants. We'll explain what to do nogi in a moment. Now I'm going to flatten my partner out. I always want to take care of my partner's base before I even try to finish. As you can see, Eric's right now in the turtle position. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step on the mat and move my hips out in a straight line away from his shoulders while I'm stiff arming my pants grip away at about a 45 degree angle. When this happens, I'm able to break Eric's base down. Now, my outside foot is going to pendulum and I'm going to come up to block his hip. My legs come into an S position. Now to finish, I'm going to try to take my knee to his near side ear as I'm thinking about whispering into his near side ear. What this does is hyper-rotates his shoulder into a shoulder lock. Now this is our ideal omoplata position, where we take care of his base and stops him from being able to defend. We're going to do that one more time from the same angle, and I'm going to explain why I do some of the things that I do. So for this basic setup, again, all I really need to do is flare his elbow out and push his wrist that way. I can do that with the collar grip and the sleeve grip as we just did. No gi, I would control behind the head and control inside space, where I step out and get the same position. My knee, it's really important that I pinch down. Even if I don't have a collar, if my knee pinches together and Eric tries to posture, it's going to be hard for him. I'm still going to be able to get my legs in front. I transfer to the elbow, then I transfer to the pants. No gi, my hand would cup down on top of his ankle, just so he can't step over my head. We'll get to that in a second. A lot of people will triangle their legs here. It's not wrong and it's not right. Uh, when we either stomp down or triangle the legs, what I'm trying to do is pin his shoulder toward the mat. If I do that with the triangle, that's fine. If I just stomp down, that's also fine. The purpose of that is to stop him from posturing up. We'll explain some of the benefits and drawbacks of triangling later on. The reason that I do these two grips, the elbow grip and the pants grip, if I lose his elbow, I've lost the omoplata. If his elbow is able to crest my hips and knee line, for example, if he pulls it out, 
I've lost the submission and I've lost the control position. We're going to return to that concept over and over. So that's why I always like to control his elbow. A lot of times people will control the sleeve, but A, I feel like that's a little bit less secure than putting a block in. I end up to use grip strength to maintain it. And also, this works gi as well as no gi. I control the pants because the three most common uh, counters to the omoplata are for Eric to make posture, or for Eric to roll over his shoulder, and for Eric to step over my head. A combination of these grips stops us from doing all of those things. You will see other variations of grips. A lot of people do belt and pants, and those aren't wrong. There are situations that will use those too. But when I refer to the standard omoplata position, this is what I'm referring to. When I get up, a lot of people, the one thing that I do want to emphasize is a lot of people make what I consider a mistake of trying to sit up right away and block the far hip. The problem with that is if I do that, Eric can often roll. And that's one of the common defenses that we'll learn how to counter. Now we have counters for the roll, but we'd rather prevent than have to deal with the problem. So instead what I do is I maintain my grip on the pants, take my outside foot, pendulum myself up, which allows me to block the hip with my elbow before anything bad happens, right? Uh, that's also why I try to flatten him out before I finish. If we're unable to flatten him out, then that's when we do the chop up. But here's why I like to flatten him out. If he's in the turtle, he can make posture or he can roll. We'll explain how to deal with those things later. But to break him down, I'm going to move my hips. Like if you can imagine a line that goes between Eric's shoulders and just extends out throughout the room. That's the way I want to put my hips in. If I have the triangle, I'm going to unlock the triangle, move my hips out while I'm pushing the grip in the opposite direction. So when Eric's shoulders and his leg go in the opposite direction, that's when he's flat. Safest thing to do is flatten him, chop and come up, and block the hip. Last detail for now in this standard omoplata position. The, a lot of people will raise their hips to finish, and it definitely works to hyper-rotate the shoulder. The problem is, when I create space, Eric is often able to come back up to the turtle. So come on back up. Now, you can still finish here, and we'll show methods for finishing here before, but this also allows Eric to do certain defenses like um, maybe he can roll over his shoulder here, maybe he can make posture. I just don't want to deal with any of that. Instead, I'd prefer to finish, go back down, flat the piece. I would prefer to finish without allowing him access to any of his defenses. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come forward as low to the mat as I can. If I have to finish, if I have to bring my hips up to finish, I will, but I'd rather not allow him access to any of his defenses. So, when I refer to the standard omoplata position, what I'm referring to is I have him caught in the omoplata, and I have my grip on his elbow, and I have my grip on his pants. From there, we're going to work to flatten him out, and flatten him out and finish. You can finish whether he's flat or not, and in the finishing section of the instructional, we'll show you how to do each of those. The focus of this instructional is the omoplata, but the omoplata doesn't exist in isolation. There's all kinds of other positions in jiu-jitsu that it interacts with. I think of jiu-jitsu in terms of hubs, or what I like to call islands of safety in the sea of danger. And so if I can get to a hub where I can be safe and attack from that hub, that's where I'll go. This setup involves us trying to drag our opponent's arm across our center line. If we get it, we have access to a bunch of attacks. If he doesn't let us get it, that's because he's defended in a way that will set up the omoplata. So if I start in my closed guard, I'm going to try to dominate one of Eric's arms with two grips. I'm going to have one hand making a C-clamp on the outside and one hand making sort of a meat hook with no gi grip behind his tricep. The way that this would work, I would lift my hips, try to drag his elbow across my center arm. Once we get here, we have arm bars, we have back takes, we have pendulum sweeps to mount, all sorts of stuff. The thing is, Eric knows that I have all that stuff. And so Eric doesn't want me to drag his elbow across the center line. Even very inexperienced people realize they don't want that to happen. So often when I try, Eric anchors his elbow to the outside of my, of, my, of my hip. Another thing that I want to focus on is if the elbow's outside my hip, the omoplata is usually there. I just have to flare the elbow, often using my own hips, right? So if he lets us get the elbow across, cool, we're into that hub for attack. If he defends, we're into the hub for the omoplata. And so all I'm going to do is take my inside hand, my outside hand, and swim inside. I'm going to frame his face, step on the, on the hip, move my hips out. You see how my hip is able to powerfully flare his elbow. Once we're here, I'm going to get my standard grips to the elbow and to the pants. I'll change the angle in a bit so you can see what I'm doing to the pants. Detail about getting your leg in front. I'm a flexible person. I've been doing yoga for a long time, so I can just put my leg in front. If you're a person that struggles, don't worry 
Um, you don't have to be super flexible to do the omoplata at all. You can kind of see that my body is in the shape of a C right now where I'm looking at Eric. If you're struggling with get your, getting your leg in front of his face, just uncoil your body like a spring. Now, very easy to step in front. Once we step in front, we're going to pull this leg down. Now again, sometimes I'll triangle to pin his shoulder down. Usually I just stomp my two feet down. Now we're going to do our flattening technique where we take our pants grip, stiff arm it toward the wall, and move my hip in a straight line this way. Flatten Eric, chop to come up, make an S. I try to whisper in his near side ear, and my buddy taps. Notice that my hips are not raising too much. We're going to change the angle a little bit so you can see. So we're starting the close guard. Side note, I always like to start in the close guard for my omoplatas. If you open your guard on your own, then you're attacking. If he's opening your guard, you're being passed. And so we want to start with our own closed guard to, to put a barrier in place for his pass. So I start with a C clamp on the outside and a meat hook behind his tricep. I'm going to try to drag his elbow across, but he's not letting me. You see how his elbow is framed outside my hip? Now I just need to control inside space. So my C clamp comes inside and make a frame. Step on his hip, move my own hips out. Very important to have the knee pinched down. I transfer to the elbow grip. Uncoil my body, leg comes in front as I grab the pants. You notice that my pants grip is palm down. This is because one of the things we're going to deal with later is when he tries to jump over to the far side by stepping over your head. Step on the mat, move your hips out to side, flatten him out. Right leg is going to pendulum up. Block the far side hip with your elbow and finish the elbow clock out. The arm drag setup from closed guard is a really high percentage setup, and what I love most about it is that it's safe. Either we get our first option or we don't. If we get our first option, everything's golden. If we don't get our first option, we're still safe, able to create another high percentage attack. And finally, if he takes away our second option, we're still in the closed guard, meaning he hasn't started to pass. So always think about that when you're building your jujitsu. What is a safe, powerful way for me to advance position, leading inevitably to submission without putting myself in danger? The arm drag setup is a really powerful setup. But what if, to defend, instead of posting his elbow outside the hip, my partner makes a grip on my collar? It can be difficult to flare his elbow. But don't worry, we have an entry to the omoplata for that as well. So, if Eric's in my closed guard, and I go to drag his arm. A lot of times he's gonna make a grip on my collar, right? So now if I try to drag it across, it's hard, and it can be difficult to get the omoplata as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break his grip in a grip breaking technique that is itself really useful, but we're also gonna get his arm out in space, which is gonna enable us to set up a bunch of other techniques. So the advantage to him making a grip is now I know where his hand is gonna be. If he wants to give up his grip, then we'll move his arm in the way that we described before. But if he wants to make the grip, I know exactly where to find his hand. So in this case, I'm going to make a cross grip. I'm going to roll four fingers and put my knuckles against the back of his wrist. Then my hand's going to come under and grab my own wrist like I'm covering a wrist watch. And I'm just going to punch it straight to the ceiling. It's a really powerful grip break because it go, attacks the, uh, the ends of Eric's fingers. Now, when Eric has an anchor against my collar, I can't really move his arm. But once I get his grip out in space, there are a lot of things that I can do. I could drag it across to get to the arm drag hub we talked about earlier, or I can go to what I call the overhook guard. This hand is gonna swim inside as I pull this behind my head and I wrap. And I get a nice tight overhook. My personal preferred thing to do is feed the collar here and just lock this overhook in position. Obviously not an option no gi. If it's not an option no gi, or if it's not an option either because it's no gi or his gi is too tight because he washed it too much, then you just try to touch your own chin. And now, if Eric tries to yank his, his overhook out, it's gonna be really hard. To continue to control the position, I'm gonna grab the crown of the head and just bring him down. I don't wanna grab the base of the neck because now if Eric postures up, he might be able to bring me with him, whereas here, I'm at the end of the lever. Now, there are a lot of things that we can do from here, and we'll get into a couple of them, but um, I'm gonna show the setup one more time and then how we enter the omoplata from here. So maybe I tried the arm drag, or maybe my partner just decided to make a collar grip. I'm going to get a cross grip on his sleeve, come under, and check my watch. If his forearm is against my body, I'm going to lift my hips and drop my hips, allowing me to bring my arm under. Cover my watch, punch the grip to the ceiling. This hand is going to come toward the camera while my body comes forward and this other hand swims inside.
I don't let go of this sleeve grip until I've already wrapped the overhook, pinching my elbow tight to my body. I'm gonna come behind his head and collect the overhook. Now there are a lot of attacks again from the overhook position, but we're doing omoplata today. So in order to set up the omoplata, you can see how I've already isolated his arm on the far side and that his elbow is flared away from his body. My hand's gonna come from his head to frame his neck. I'm gonna open my guard, move my hips out, and bring my knee behind his shoulder blade. You can see the angle for the position already. I'm gonna keep my frame, extend my body out, bring my foot in front, and come to his elbow. Immediately I let go of the overhook and grip for the pants. Step on the mat and start to do my regular flattening. I would finish the omoplata from here. Let's show that one more time from a different angle. The grip break itself is a really good technique for you. If your partner is able to make grips and dominate position, you have to be able to break those grips or else you're never going to get your own game going. So I'm going to grip. You see how Eric is taking away space here and I can, it can be hard to get this in? I'm just going to use my closed guard to lift my hips in the air and as I drop my hips, now I create the space for my hand to come under. He doesn't know when I'm going to drop my hips. Grab my wristwatch, punch to the ceiling, this grip goes backward, but my other arm goes forward, and I grab. Now, if we were to hang out in the overhook guard, there are collar chokes we can work from here. There is a triangle we can work from here, which we will in the next technique. But for now, we're just going to go straight into omoplata. Frame the neck, move the hips out. Very important to get that knee high and pinching up on the shoulder blade. Uh, omoplata is Brazilian Portuguese for shoulder blade, which is how the technique was named. So I keep this nice pinch. I keep my frame until I uncoil my body and bring my leg in front, grip transfers to the elbow, grip transfers to the pants. Grip fighting is a, an art and a science all to itself, and there's some great instructional resources out there for grip fighting. This is a simple but really effective grip break that allows you to set up the overhook guard. The overhook guard, much like the arm drag position, is also a really great hub that there are cool attacks from, and omoplatas exist um, in all throughout the hub, but we can just go straight into it from this overhook guard position. Once we achieve the overhook guard position, a really common attack from there is the triangle. I'm going to show that triangle entry, but mostly the reason I'm showing this is one of the most common ways you're going to find the omoplata is when your opponent defends the triangle. Omoplata, triangle, and armbar work together in a closed circuit, and if you understand how those three techniques function together, if your opponent defends one, you can trap him into one of the others and just get him into a tight circuit where one of the three submissions he has to give you. So let's start by reiterating that overhook guard entry. I'm in the closed guard, my partner has a grip, I get a cross grip, lift my hips, grab my own wrist. Break the grip, wrap, come to the overhook, control. So I have this arm isolated, right? If I can control space inside Eric's far arm, I can easily lock one in, one out, which is a triangle setup. Now, a lot of times we show this from the punch block series where if Eric's punching my ribs and I can get my knee inside, right, and do this. But just from a grappling setting, what I'll do is I'll angle my hips out and get my knee inside. Cut behind his elbow. When I'm ready, I slide to the wrist, angle my body out. Row, kick, triangle. Right? Very good triangle setup, and uh, for those of you that do triangles, I really find this to be high percentage. Now, for our traditional triangle finish, what we would do is pass Eric's arm across, finish the triangle like that, because this leg is pinching off this carotid artery, and I need his shoulder against his carotid to pinch off his other carotid artery. But, if I lock him in, and Eric knows I want his arm across, a lot of times he's going to do exactly what he just did, right? Exactly what he just innately did. Because you see that space that creates between his shoulder and his carotid. Now, the triangle choke is very difficult. But what has he just done with his elbow? He's flared his own elbow, and you see his palm is face to the ceiling. That's the very concept that we were talking about in the first technique on, on the instructional. So whenever that happens, it's a free omoplata. I'm going to frame his neck, move my hips out, pinching down with my knee. Extend out, get my grips into the omoplata position. So if we start from the triangle, and he knows I want to do this, a lot of times he's going to hide his arm from me, right? So this isn't just true of this overhook guard triangle, right? Any triangle you catch, I see people do this all the time. If your partner does this, this is the time to switch off to omoplata. 
frame the neck so he can't turn back into me. Move my hips out, pinch my knee down. Control the elbow, leg comes in front, and we'll plot. In jiu-jitsu, we don't want to give people problems. Problems have solutions. We want to give them dilemmas, where if he makes one choice, it takes him down a bad path, and he makes another choice, it takes him down a bad path. In this case, he flared his elbow and turned his palm to the ceiling to defend the triangle. Cool, now I have him caught in the omoplata. One of the defenses for the omoplata, which we'll address later, is posture. But if you're at postures, I simply bring my legs up, shoot my hips, and catch him in the triangle again. If he continues to bury his arm, and so I can't finish the triangle, I'm always going to have the option to go back to omoplata. It. It's a dilemma, not a problem. Problems have solutions, the ones don't. So let's show that one more time from a different angle. If I have Eric in the closed guard, he's got his grip. I can break the grip. I use that grip break to enter the overhook guard position. Move my hips out, get inside his other arm. Slide to the wrist, shoot, lock. And again, this triangle setup applies anytime there's a triangle, right? If his elbow continues to be isolated over here and you can flare it, you can't over plot it from here. I would to finish the triangle, try to get it across, he defends, no problem. Frame, leg in front, on the plot. If he postures, right back to the triangle. Armbar triangle and omoplata exist in the same galaxy, and it's very easy to transition between the three. Learning to transition between the three, as we'll do throughout this entire instructional, is going to keep your partner trapped in the web so that you're in a control position leading inevitably to a submission. When you're attacking one limb, generally speaking, that's where your opponent's focus is. And that's where you want it, right? And that's also appropriate for your opponent. If you're attacking an arm bar, your opponent's going to be concerned with that arm. However, we can use that opportunity when we go for the arm bar to attack an omoplata on the far side. One of my favorite things to do in jiu-jitsu is punishing people who do the right things. And so if someone does the correct thing in order to defend an arm bar, it still takes us into a place where we can omoplata. So if I go for a simple closed guard arm bar, this heralds back to the arm drag setup that we did earlier. Maybe I dominate his arm with two arms on one. Lift my hips, drag his elbow across. Frame his neck. And to go for the arm bar, I would step on the hip, pinching my knee in tight, rotate, heel kick him in the back of the head to break his posture. Don't actually heel kick your partner in the back of the head, but see how that's the direction we want him moving. Bring my leg in front, pinch, pinch, very gently raise my hips to get the tap. Now, one of the common ways my partner can defend, and a correct way, is he can grab his own bicep with this hand, right? So if he grabs his own bicep, and what ideally he would want to do is get this hand under my leg, but I'm not going to let him do that. Instead, I am going to swim inside, make his palm face the ceiling. So then one more time, he grabs, swim inside, palm faces the ceiling. Now, I'm going to immediately control the elbow, step on the mat, move my hips out, Grab the elbow, grab the pants. Move my hips, flatten, chop to come up, block his hip, make my knees into the nice S, whisper in his near side ear, yeah. get my partner to submit. Another time. Two hands on one on the arm bar that we want, on the arm that we want to arm bar. C clamp on the outside wrist, meat hook on the outside tricep. Lift my hips. As I drop my hips, I drag, right? Now again, if he were to defend by bringing his elbow to the outside, we would omoplata plot this arm. But instead, he's let me get into the web where I can arm bar. I'm gonna frame this part of the neck, step on the hip, rotate. My knee pit chops down into his knee pit with my heel aiming for the back of his head to break his posture. You always want your proponent's posture broken when you're in this system. Bring your legs in front. But my buddy is gonna try to defend. Cool. Swim inside. Your head side hand, whichever side of your, whichever hand of yours is closest to his head, controls the elbow. Your other hand is going to control the pants. Step out into the omoplata. And you notice, let me say something else here. I can triangle my legs and stomp down, and if Eric tries to posture, very difficult. Or I can just stomp my two feet to the mat, and if Eric tries to posture, also very difficult. Either way, there are situations where we will want to triangle, and we will get into those in a second. It's mostly when we stop. When we triangle, what I'm really trying to do is stop his elbow from escaping my hips line. 
Because if I lose the elbow, I've lost the elbow fly out. But if I don't lose the elbow, I sit up, bring my legs in the shape of an S, and finish. The last detail about this, we talked about how armbar triangle and omoplata sort of exist in the same universe. So maybe I go for this arm lock, right? My buddy defends the arm lock. And as I swim, I go for the omoplata. If my buddy postures up, there's the triangle again, right? If he leaves his arm there, right back to the omoplata. If he takes his arm out, finish the triangle. There are solo drills at the end of the instructional that'll help you get this web tight. You can also do some partner drills. They're gonna be really useful in terms of getting those three techniques to work together the way they should. The closed guard is one of my favorite positions in jiu-jitsu. We can attack, our partner has to open our guard before they can initiate any offense, and best of all, there's really cool omoplata setups from there. So I'm gonna show you a setup and a half from the closed guard. So the first setup, a lot of times, if people decide they want to stall, wrestler guys will do this a lot, they'll cage your hips. You see how Eric's elbows are outside my hips and they're kind of pinching down? So if I try and move my hips out, it's hard. I call this next one the stall applata, because if he's trying to stall, I'm going to lift my hips, flare the elbow, and push. And you can see that kind of an entry. And this is true for any of the other setups we've shown so far, right? If he has a grip here, I can double up on this, uh, this, this arm and flare it out. But if he's a little more savvy, and if he postures up, right, and he gets normal grips. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a cross grip, and we're gonna attack still from the closed guard. Now the cross grip's one of my favorite things uh, in jujitsu because we can always expose our partner's back. We can also use it to enter the, uh, the overhook guard like we did earlier. But today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this cross grip to get Eric off his base, underhook this left side leg, my left side, and I'm gonna use this to enter the omoplata. So first, cross grip, four fingers in the sleeve, my knuckles are against the back of his wrist. I'm gonna open my guard and step on his shoulder. As I step on his shoulder, I'm gonna come up and under. You see how that kind of gets him off his base a little bit? He has to compensate his base, allowing my arm to come palm up under his leg. As we do that, I'm gonna lift my hips as high as I can, and something that we'll return to, I'm gonna stuff his sleeve in my pocket. One more time. So, got the cross grip. I need to get him off his base a little if he's hunkered down. So I'm gonna angle out, step on his shoulder. As I get him off his base, I come up and under his leg, lift my hips as high as I can, and stuff the sleeve in my pocket. Now, sometimes, this is an exception to grabbing the, uh, to grabbing the outside of the pants. If we already have this underhook, a lot of times we can just flatten him out here and enter the only plot of position. So one more time, let's do that from a different angle. Let's do it from the same direction. Key detail of this, and this is gonna become more important when we get into the setups when he stands, I want my hips as high as possible to isolate his arm, and I wanna make sure to shove his sleeve toward my pocket, toward like the left side of my pants. So I get my cross grip. I'm gonna angle my hips out, coming inside, stepping on his shoulder. Get him a little bit off his base, come up and under. Most important, I'm hooking with my, with my uh, calf on the back of, his, uh, on the back of his, his lap, lifting up, shoving. Now, again, ordinarily I would transfer and grab for the pants back here, but as long as I have this underhook already, I'm still going to usually be able to flatten it when I come up. Then we're going to finish the other one. So, closed guard. I want you to remember the two-on-one, for almost all of the setups that I show, if you're having a tough time isolating his arm and flaring his elbow with one of your arms or with just your hips, you can double up on that arm, push the wrist, and flare the elbow to set up the omoplata. If he's a little more savvy and he's actually trying to pass your guard, then we may be able to do things like the cross grip that gets him off his base and sets up our high hips for the omoplata. So far we've focused on setups from the closed guard, but sometimes you realize you can't maintain your closed guard and your partner's gonna open it. In that situation, it's better to open your guard on your own terms so you're able to defend and attack on your own terms. If you open your guard, you're playing open guard. If they open your guard, you're probably getting your guard passed. You don't want them to get ahead of you in the game. So I'm gonna show a safe open guard transition that's also gonna allow us to set up the own plot. So if I'm in the closed guard, 
When I feel Eric go for the standard guard open, I'm gonna get double sleeve grips. Two sleeves, right? When I realize he's about to open his guard, I'm gonna open, feet on the hips. Now I need to control inside space. My knee swims inside, flares his elbow out. My other knee swims inside, flares his elbow out. It's almost like a butterfly stretch where I have two feet on the hips and my knees are flexed out. So if Eric tries to move around a little bit, I'm gonna stay attached. It's a very safe position here. And what I like about this is if we ever choose to just go back to the closed guard, that is an option as well. One other thing I, I like to do, I do like to go back to the closed guard from the open guard because it frustrates our opponent. They've just done good work to open our guard and then we went back up the positional ladder on them. It frustrates them and frustrated people make mistakes. But we can also keep this position, which is a difficult position to pass, and use it to attack the omoplata. So you notice that Eric's elbows are already flared. Now I can't attack his flared elbow until I get my knee behind his flared elbow, so I'm gonna pick a side. In this case, it's gonna be my left side. I keep the tension, and when I'm ready, I'm gonna push off my right foot and kick my left leg straight. As I do that, my left hand is gonna push right to my left pocket. And you can see already the omoplata. Let's show that one more time. I'm gonna do it a little bit slower. The three component parts all happen at the same time, but I'm gonna show the three component parts. So I'm pushing off, kicking my leg straight, and pushing his hand right to where, where my pocket would be. My knee pinches down. I'm gonna switch my grips. I no longer need the sleeve grip. Grip comes to the elbow, leg comes in front, and I get to the standard omoplata. Let's show that again, with Eric facing the same way he is. So I'm in the closed guard. If Eric just opens my guard, just open it, and now I choose to go to my setup, now I'm behind, right? He's in a nice combat base, I can't control inside space. He's more in a position to attack than I am. If instead, I'm like, I'm not sure how long I'm gonna be able to hold this, I get two sleeve grips. Sleeve grips are a, a bit of a more advanced strategy um, but there, it's a really good option in this instance simply because uh, it, it, it controls where he can place his hands. So when I realize he's going to open my guard, I get two sleeves. And as he starts to open my guard, I'm going to open it for him. And you see now I'm able to attack the inside space, flare my knee out, get my other knee in, right? Now, Eric's going to have to disrupt my connection to him if he's going to pass. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing my knees to the outside and push-pull control, where I'm pulling my grips and I'm pushing with my knees. So the side closest to the camera is going to be the side that kicks. I'm going to push off the far side and kick with the left side. And you see how I use that? Remember the principles of this from the start of the DVD, right? If we can flare his elbow and if we can make his palm face the ceiling, we can omoplata. So it's already flared for me. So as I kick, I'm just going to show. The palm faces the ceiling. Knee pinches down. I no longer need this grip. So I control the elbow line. If he can yank his elbow out, we're in trouble. Leg comes in front, stomp down to control his posture, grab the pants, set. My hips are gonna move in this line while I shove, and I flatten them out, chop my leg to get up, and finish. I think of jiu-jitsu in terms of positional hierarchies and positional ladders. The closed guard is a better position than the open guard, by and large, and I certainly believe that it is. So if my opponent starts to move up the positional ladder, I'm gonna take steps to stop him, to protect myself, and to set up a high percentage attack like the old plot. I think the lasso guard is one of the first open guards that people should start playing with. Not only does it have a lot of the same benefits as the closed guard, you can kind of keep them stuck to you, but it's also Omoplata City. There are a lot of terrific Omoplata setups from here. The first technique I'm gonna show from the lasso is my personal favorite Omoplata setup. It's safe, it's effective, it looks a little fancy, but it's actually not that complicated, and when you hit it, it's really, really high percentage. We'll go over a couple of other setups from the lasso as well. So, first, how to set up the lasso guard. A lot of different lasso setups. From the closed guard, though, I'm gonna get two sleeves, step on the hip, angle my body out. My leg comes over, and my instep is gonna tuck right behind his armpit. I wanna keep a nice, tight connection. Really important now, you see how I move my hips out with my left hip in the air? Now I'm gonna reset my hips, pointing my pelvis to the ceiling and angling my knee out. When I do that, I'm gonna turn my palm up like Spider-Man shooting a web, flip, flip, because Eric's defense to the, to the lasso and how he can disrupt it, he's trying to circle this hand out. It's very difficult. But if I let my knee tension get a little loose, 
or if my hand position changes, now we're right back to where we started. So, one more time. Two sleeves, step on the hips, angle out, leg comes over top. My instep is basically hugging the back of Eric's shoulder. My knee angles out and my palm faces the ceiling. Now what do I do with this leg? As long as I'm controlling inside space, it doesn't really matter. One of two things that I would be doing here, stepping on the hip and getting the same push-pull control we did for the previous technique, keeps me attached to Eric. So if Eric moves around, you see that I stay stuck in. It's a really, really difficult guard to pass. I can also be doing what's called the spider lasso, where I step on the bicep, and again, I'm gonna affect his posture while also controlling inside space. You can hit this technique with either of those two foot positions. I prefer to have my foot on the hip just for rotational pressure. So here's the thing, when I'm ready, uh, I need to be controlling Eric's posture. So I'm gonna give up this grip and come to the near side collar with a cross grip. Now you still wanna be controlling inside space. So if he tries to pummel inside, we have to defend, right? Either with our knee or with our foot. Now three things are gonna happen at once. I'm gonna let go and come behind his elbow. I'm gonna pull with my collar and flare his elbow. So both of these grips are gonna to pull toward the camera while I kick the leg straight. I'm gonna push off with my right leg, and if I can, rotate all the way in position to face the camera while I lock the legs. Right for the over quad. We'll break that down and do it a bit slower. I start with two sleeves, feet on the hips, angle my hips out, leg comes over, hug the back of his shoulder with my instep, turn my pelvis to the ceiling and my palm to the ceiling while I angle my left knee out. I'm controlling inside space by stepping on the hip, flaring my knee out. I can also do this with the spider lasso. And maybe I'll do one version of it with the spider lasso just to show it work, that it works both ways. When I'm ready, I give up this grip and come to the cross collar, which helps me both control posture and get some of my rotation. I'm gonna push off with this leg, I'm gonna do it slow this time, as I peel and kick the leg straight. And as you can see, the sort of rotation that I get allows my leg to come into his head. Now usually, I will lock my legs and stomp down here. There's another finish in the transition that we'll get into later in the DVD. Come to the elbow, come to the pants, and from there we do our standard flatten and finish. But let's break this down in another way. Two sleeves. On the hip, hips come out. Legs, leg comes over and in. Knee angles out, pelvis points to the ceiling. I'm controlling inside. What if my partner tries to pull back with his left leg and I can't keep, or with his left arm, and I can't keep this type of tension? I'll step on the bicep, come to the collar. Now if Eric tries to swim back inside, I still have a lot of control with my foot on his bicep. Even without the grip, I'm able to maintain inside space and I don't have to do it forever. The collar is gonna pull like I'm doing a collar drag and I'm gonna come right behind his elbow and I'm gonna flare it like I'm opening a French door while I kick my leg straight. Sorry about the back of your head. <laughs> so there's another finish that we'll get into here where I come across and I get under his far armpit. But for now, let's not worry about that. Let's just remember that later in the instruction. Stomp down to make sure he can't posture. Come to the elbow, come to the pants. Flatten, chop. That lasso position is very powerful. It's a very difficult guard to pass and people make a lot of mistakes in it. I like another couple of things about it. First, if I ever choose to, I can give up the lasso and go back to the close guard, which is an option. And second, most people are concerned with the arm that you have lasso. And that's a valid concern, because as we've just seen, we can attack that arm. But there's also a really powerful attack on the far side arm as well, and we're gonna get into that next. One of the most common mistakes people make when trying to pass the lasso guard is trying to pass toward the lasso. Now that's understandable. When I have this arm tied up, that's gonna focus a lot of their concern. And that's justifiable, right? If they can't clear the lasso, they're probably not gonna be able to pass and they're always gonna be in danger from my attacks. But we can take advantage of that if they're focused on that, that arm to attack the far side arm. And here's how we do that. So let's not skimp on our fundamental lasso setups, right? Two sleeves, two feet on hips, angle out, leg swings over. I'm angling my foot to sort of pull Eric, and I rotate my hips so my hips are pointed at the ceiling with my knee angled out. Now, I have my foot on the hip and I, I'm exhibiting push-pull control. 
Now, if Eric, for whatever reason, maybe he's hunkering down on his right side, or maybe he's like moving to the right to try to pass, there are a lot of things that I can do from here. But remember, as long as his elbow's flared and I get my knee behind it, I'm a Konomo plot. So what I'm gonna do is transfer my lasso grip to the elbow, kick straight. Remember, whenever we can double up on the arm, that just makes it more powerful, right? We're always looking for a structural advantage in jiu-jitsu, and if I can get two hands on one, then I can win. Let's show that again. And it can be a quick hitter like that. Two sleeves, angle out, leg comes over the top. We have him locked in the lasso position. One thing that, a theme that I, I want uh, to lift up in this DVD is that I look for hubs, for islands of safety in the sea of danger. I, don't, I want my jujitsu to be station to station so that I choose when the transition happens. This is one reason I like positions like the closed guard, the lasso guard, why I like top position, where I can take a minute, think about what mistakes my partner is making and adapt accordingly. In this case, if he's too concerned about me attacking that arm, I'm just gonna attack the other one. Let go of the lasso grip, come to the elbow, kick your other leg straight. I'm shoving this to the pocket again. Hips on the mat, control the elbow, his posture is already starting to break, I stiff arm the leg, chop up with my outside foot, attack his other shoulder that I've been attacking in the rest of the instructional. The lasso guard is really powerful. I think of it almost as a closed open guard, because once you get somebody there, they're pretty stuck. If they make the mistake of focusing too much on the arm, you have lasso, just attack the other arm and uh, set up the omoplata. So from the lasso guard, we've learned how to attack the arm that has the lasso and the far arm that is not controlled by the lasso. Sometimes though, my buddy is not going to let me get that far arm at all. He knows that he doesn't want to be tied up in the lasso and knows there's lots of techniques that I can do there, so he's just going to keep that other arm away from me. If that happens, he creates the space for me to do an inversion. Now this inversion is going to allow us to attack the lasso side arm with an omoplata and also with the triangle depending on how his reaction uh, goes. But we're going to go with the omoplata today. So we start from the omoplata position, or we start from the open guard. I'm going to get into my lasso, except for this time, Eric breaks this grip and pulls it away from me, right? And so now I'm like, but I want to get you trapped into either that regular lasso position or the spider lasso, but I can't get your arm. Maybe I want to attack the far side of the but I can't get to the far arm. The thing is, if I can't get this arm, that creates space for me. So I'm going to invert my body back that way. First, I'm going to take my foot that's on the, near, the far side hip and bring it to hook the near side hip. This arm, with the heel of my hand toward Eric and the palm of my hand facing the camera, is going to go under and in front of his knee. And as this happens, I'm going to use this energy to shoot my hips into the air and come to the omoplata. I'm going to show that a couple of different times from different angles. Open guard, two sleeves, feet come out, get the lasso. My buddy breaks the grip. Maybe I want it, I can't get it. I'm going to take my foot that was on this hip and bring it to hook against this hip. This is where I get my energy for the inversion combined with my hand, which I use kind of like a shoehorn against his knee. Hips come up, go to the omoplata. Now if Eric postures up in the transition, there's a triangle right there. A lot of people go straight for the triangle. I personally prefer the omoplata. It's one less stage along the journey. And then I go to the triangle if he transitions into, you know, if he postures up and that allows me to transition into the triangle. So let's do that one more time from this angle. I get two sleeves. Step on the hips, angle my body out. Now this looks fancy, but all it is is a simple granny roll. It's the kind of thing that you can do with some of the solo drills that we're gonna show at the end of the instruction. But I get my lasso fundamentals, right? I get my lasso. If I don't get the lasso, it doesn't work. But Eric won't let me get my full guard that I want. So I take this and I hook it against his hip. I'm gonna use that to lift my hips up. As I lift my hips up, shoot them as high as I can, come to the omoplata. If his posture breaks in transition, that's great. Otherwise, we'll do the same sort of posture breaks that we've done before. The last thing I'll say about these three lasso guard techniques, all three of them, especially the first two, also work if our partner stands up. I've hit both lasso techniques really regularly when our partner stands. And so these lasso guard techniques work 
regardless of whether our partner's on their knees or whether they stand. We're going to use this opportunity, though, to talk about more standing techniques. And so we're going to move now from when our partner stays on their knees in the open guard to when they stand to try to pass. And those are the next omoplata setups we're going to get into. If our partner stands, omoplata is a great way to break their posture and bring them back to the mat while also entering them into a submission system. One of my favorite ways to set up the omoplata when my partner stands comes from De La Hiva guard. And we can do this with a variety of different grips. So let's start with one of the more basic and then move into the little more advanced grip configurations. If I have the De La Hiva hook, my De La Hiva hook comes outside in and I make an active hook against the inside of Eric's thigh. This leg is my control leg that stops his leg from running away from me. This leg is my attack leg, which is gonna force him to come off balance. For this homoplata, the first one, I'm gonna get a cross collar grip and a same side sleeve grip. So this is usually easy to get because my partner's gonna come down and try to grip my collar. We'll discuss what happens if he does a strategy with his elbow and knee connection to, to enhance his base in just a second. But for now, he grips my collar, I grip the sleeve. I'm gonna grip the cross collar. Now I said the daily heave hook is my control leg, so if Eric tries to get away from me, I stay attached. This is the leg that, that off-balances him. I'm going to take my collar grip and drag it in this direction while I use my, sleep, my, my foot to push his knee away from me. Now watch what happens to his arm. See how his arm comes out? Ideally, too, I am going to make him base like that. Now I take out my daily heave hook and put my knee behind his shoulder. If he has the sleeve grip, it's okay. It's still going to work. I'm shoving toward my pocket. Now, just bring my leg in front and stomp down. You see how that breaks Eric's posture and he's no longer able to stand. From here, we're back to our regular standard omoplata position finish where I cup the elbow, grab the pants, move my hips out, chop and sit up to finish. Let's do that one more time. A really critical detail here, we want to extend his arm. The reason for that is twofold. First, we want to disrupt his base. And if his arm is out like this, his arm's exposed and his base is also off. Second, I need to get my hips as high as possible up into his armpit. So my partner comes down and grabs my, my, my collar. I'm going to get the same side sleeve grip and the cross collar grip. I'm going to pull with my collar in one direction while I'm pushing away with my outside foot right above his knee line, right? And again, ideally, you make him base like that. Now, if this comes out, my hips come up. If I have to step on his hip to do it, great. Turn my knee down, leg comes in front, my weight and me stomping enables me to come to the top. This is one of those where I usually will triangle my legs and then stomp down with it because we can't have the elbow escape of our, our hip line or else we're going to lose it and he's not going to come down to the mat with us. Show up for one more angle and then I'll show what we'll troubleshoot in a bit where if we're unable to disrupt his base. This is a really powerful way to disrupt our partner's base, but some guys are beasts, right? So we wanna, we're not training to beat people who suck. We're training to beat beasts. Cross collar, same side sleep. Active daily heel hook, knee, foot on the knee. Push and drag. Hook comes out, step on the hip, hips come right up, right? And you already see when my hips come up, that flares his elbow. I can also shove. Knee comes down, now trying the legs, stomp down. A lot of pressure on Eric's shoulder, forcing him to go to the knees. Then I would, I would flatten it out in the same technique that we used before, moving my hips this way while I stiff arm his leg away from me. Here's the thing though, we're going to stay from this angle because I want you to see a disruption technique. So sometimes, either because our partner has great base or maybe we didn't get that kind of off balancing that we want, he's able to maintain this elbow to knee connection. And if I do that, I can't get my hips up in for the omoplata. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post off of my far foot on his hip, take my hook out, and get my knee right behind his elbow, sticking it right into his tricep. I'm going to pull with the collar when my knee disrupts his elbow. If I can disrupt his elbow to knee connection, I'm always going to be able to get in there and omoplata. What I'm aiming for is this part of my knee right behind his tricep, making a hole where his elbow and knee are connected. If I can disrupt that elbow to knee connection, I'm always going to be able to own plot. So, I'll show another way to disrupt that in the next technique, but mostly what I want to get across here is this. We disrupt his base by kicking his leg out and pulling his arm. If we can make his arm straighten, creating space for our hip to come up under his armpit, we got him. If we can't, then we have to use our knee behind his tricep to move that elbow out of the way and enable us to get our hips up for the elbow. 
So we just saw how to set up the omoplata from the daily heave guard. The most important thing is disrupting my buddy's elbow to knee connection. If I can disrupt that elbow to knee connection, I can get my hips up into his armpit and omoplata. If I can't, then I can use my knee to disrupt that elbow to knee connection, kind of driving with the knee to get the elbow out of the way. But what if our partner's base is too good for that? In that case, we're going to go with what's called the shin on shin guard to set it up. So I get my daily heave guard, and I get the same grips I had before. I get the collar and the sleeve. Now, usually, when you are pulling with the collar and pushing away, especially if this sleeve keeps him attached to you, you're going to be able to separate him out. But there are beasts in this world, believe me, I trained with a bunch of them. And so let's say we tried that, we tried to get our knee behind his tricep and we were just unable to get his elbow away from his knee. He's just really rooted in position. I'm going to step on the mat, scoop my butt away, and go to what's called shin on shin guard. I'll show this from a different angle, but what I'm doing is I'm, with active toes, I'm hook, attaching my shin to his shin in like we used to play the old game Barrel of Monkeys, like attaching like the Barrel of Monkeys hook. There's a lot of cool things we can do from the shin on shin guard, but one of the first things that we can do is I'm gonna lift with this shin grip in this direction while I yank with the collar in the opposite direction. And you can see, even if I can't get his foot off the mat, I'm definitely gonna disrupt that elbow to knee connection. From here, foot comes to the hip, lift, flare, break the posture. One more time from a different angle, just so you can see this hook. Before we get into it, like Eric, just angle your body this way, please. So the shin on shin hook is like this. I can't have ballerina feet. Ballerinas are badass athletes, but we're doing jujitsu today. Hooking, so that if Eric tries to get away from me, I can follow, right? Also a very powerful defense against the knee cut pass. And there are a lot of cool things we can do. A lot of people these days just play shin on shin guard. And Michelle Nicolini is one of the best in the world at that. I learned some of these techniques from her. And uh, really terrific position to play with. But what we're using it for it today is just to set up this on plot. So, hook, collar, sleeve. I tried to do the first one, he's a beast. Tried to do the second one, elbow's not going away from the knee. Move my hips out, swing that in. You can see I'm making an active hook, like right at the base of his elbow. I'm gonna drag, as if my elbow is trying to hit the mat right there, while I lift. And ideally, this is what his body looks like. Foot comes to the hip, Knee comes down behind his shoulder blade, stomp down to break the posture. Grab, grab. I'm grabbing his sleeve, that's okay. I prefer to do this, but sometimes you gotta keep the grips that you got. I, I don't like moving grips in transition, especially if they're gonna be good enough to finish. Step on the mat, break my partner down, and do the same finishing details we talked about earlier. So you can see why the shin on shin guard is so effective, right? We're creating a counter pressure which lifts one of his legs while we're throwing his body in the opposite direction. He has no choice but to take his elbow away from his knee. And when his elbow's away from his knee, we can get our hips up for the omoplata. The daily heave guard is a powerful guard for both defense and attack when our partner stands. And there are a lot of different gripping configurations that you can use to defend an attack. We've just been doing the collar and sleeve, which is a classic grip, but I want to show you another gripping configuration that leads to a bunch of attacks, and specifically today, we're going to cover the omoplata. So, if Eric stands in my open guard, and I make the daily heave hook, this is always going to be fundamental, right? The daily heave hook swims from the outside in, hooks against the side, my knee comes toward my head, and that's the fundamentals. This is my attack leg, which can either get a spider hook for Dale's spider, step on his hip, step on his knee, attack all sorts of stuff. Often my partner's going to come down and grab my collar like he did before. Whether he does or whether he doesn't, it's usually possible, like if he grabs my collar, it's always going to be possible to get a cross grip. But I tend to look for the cross grip anyway, because I personally love attacking the back. And if I have a cross grip, I'm always able to expose the back. So we can do techniques like the barambolo, like the baby bolo, um, little dump sweeps, tripod sweep, all sorts of stuff from this cross grip. The other thing I like in this situation is to grab his heel. Because remember, the daily heave hook is my control leg. I don't want Eric, if Eric can disrupt this hook, I have to transition and play a different guard. And if I don't want to do that, the hook plus the ankle means if Eric does anything and moves, I stay stuck to him pretty easily, right? So typically, one of the primary things that I try and do is, to, is attack the back here. And I go back and forth between attacking the back and if he corrects his angle, like I try to attack the back. If he's like, I step forward, then I go into a tripod sweep. That's my typical back and forth lateral movement attack here. The thing is, 
You know there's a normal platter there as well, especially if he doesn't want me to take his back. So if I try to attack the back, instead I'm going to step on the hip. Instead of where I would look for, I'm just rolling to attack the back, or coming forward for the tripod, instead I take my daily heel hook out, step on the hip, and my cross grip, instead of pulling like I would if I was attacking his back, punches. Like it comes in front. The advantage to this gripping configuration is where's my hand? It's already on his leg, right? So he can't step over my head. We'll deal with what to do when he's able to step over your head during the defeating or defense portion of the instructional, but it's always better if you don't have to change grips in transition. And so in this situation, ideally, right, from the standard normal plata position, my ideal grips would be I cup the elbow, but in this case, I've landed in a position where I have control of his sleeve and I have control of the part of his leg which will allow him to step over the head. So that's one reason I really like this group configuration is it lands us in a position where we've already defeated a bunch of his defense. So show that again one more time from a different angle. So we get the daily diva guard. My buddy gets my sleeve. I get the cross grip. Now again, a lot of different attacks you can do from here. But in this case, I'm posting off his far hip so I maybe try and attack the back, but instead of trying to attack the back, I come up and step on the hip. Instead of pulling the arm across and trying to drag it, I'm punching it like I'm trying to put it in this part of my hip. My knee turns down. I stomp, breaking his posture. And you see how I land right in my control position that's basically the standard normal plata position. Like again, in my ideal world, I'd have my, my hand here. But this is going to work, and we don't want to adjust grips in transition for fear we wind up with worse grips than we started with. And we go right to our flat mountain finish. We can also finish him right there, right? And when we transition to the finishing part of the instructional, I'll show you how to finish even if we can't get him out of the turtle. But one of the reasons I love that attack is not only is it high percentage, not only does it disguise some of our other attacks, our back attacks and our tripod sweeps, but we land in a position that's really easy to control from the standard normal plot of position perspective. If our partner disrupts our daily heat of guard, if our partner stuffs our leg and tries to pass, a transition that a lot of people, including myself, love is the transition to reverse daily heat. It's a really uh, good defensive guard with some high percentage attacks. Usually, those attacks are on the near side arm, things like arm drags that you can use to take the back. But I love the omoplata on the far side here, partially because people just don't see it coming, and so very few folks expect it. Also, it allows me to use some sort of fundamental principles of jujitsu, so even if it goes wrong, I'm still in a pretty good defensive position. So first, let's talk about how to transition to the reverse daily diva. So, if I'm in the regular daily diva target, Whatever my grips are, right? Maybe I have the cross grip and the heel, maybe I have the collar and the sleeve, doesn't really matter. A lot of times, folks knowing that this leg is dangerous for them mean they're gonna to try to stuff that leg between their legs. Now immediately, what I'm gonna do is just what I did. In De La Hiva, I'm not flat on my back, but my pelvis is facing him. In reverse De La Hiva, I'm gonna have my inside hip, in this case my right hip, the hip that's closest to him, on the mat while I'm on my side. In De La Hiva, my outside hook comes in and makes a strong connection to the inside of his thigh. In reverse daily heave, my inside hook comes in and makes a strong connection to the outside of his thigh. Again, we're always arching our foot to hug because this is our control position. My foot comes, toes first, toes toward the inside, toward his belt knot, against his hip. And even if I don't make any grips, or we're going to start with no grips in this situation, Ferret comes forward, I'm able to control the distance, which is the most important part of any guard is controlling the distance. I'm going to show the transition one more time, then we're going to do the attack from there. So I'm in daily heave, and again, I might have these grips, I might have these grips. I did it with these grips before, so I'll do it with these grips. Whatever, whatever works. If he stuffs your leg, turn inside, make the hook, make the, make the foot up onto the hip. Put the foot on the hip with the, the toes pointed inside. Now, typically, we don't want to reach in jiu-jitsu. And so when we make that daily heave transition, if I don't have a grip, I'm just going to make frames, so if my partner comes out and going to smash me, the frames are there. In this case, for the attack, I need a collar grip, cross collar thumb down, which is useful if he tries to attack you, and a far side sleeve grip. Right? So if he just stays up, right? if he postures up and doesn't let me get these grips, cool, I can just go back to whatever guard I wanted initially anyway. If he just does not put any pressure on me, I can choose what guard to play. But if he does pressure into me, that gives me the grips I need for this attack from the reverse daily heave. 
So we go to the reverse of the We have a nice defensive position. He comes down, palm down, thumb in. I come and get a, a sleeve grip with the four, four fingers in. So now check it out. I'm in a nice control position. My favorite tries to run away from me. I stay attached. He tries to smash into me. I've got a lot of frames that stop him. Until he clears my hook and clears that foot off his hip, I'm in no trouble. So now I'm going to make the transition. I'm going to push off this hip, lifting my hips in the air. My foot's going to push off Eric's hip. My hips are going to come up. When they come up, I'm going to take out my hook, this hook, my right hook, and step on his hip. Now I pull the grip. Now you see it coming. Shove, angle out, knee points down, rotate, stop. And a lot of times we can come right up into the omoplata here. Let's show that one more time from this angle and from a different angle. We start in the daily hugo dart. My buddy's going to stuff my foot. I have to get on my side, folks. If I try to reverse daily hugo like this, Eric's going to easily clear my hook and pass. So we have to sort of be facing in. And I want to be controlling inside space here. So I have my toes pointed in, heel pointed out, making a hook. I have my friends waiting for him. He comes to me, cool. I just grip, palm down, thumb in, grab the collar and the sleeve. Lift. This is the, one of the most important moves in jiu-jitsu, let alone the omoplata. Just learning how to post on your partner's hip. Lift your hips in the air. Make the transition. See how I'm controlling inside space and using my knee to flare his elbow? Now all I'm going to do is punch this grip. My angle out for the omoplata. Reverse daily diva and daily diva are really powerful guards with tons of options. And so, like I said at the beginning of the instructional, there are some people watching this for whom omoplata is going to be your A game. There are some people for whom you're going to use omoplata once or twice. There are some people that may never omoplata. But even in whatever category you're in, adding these moves to your knowledge base and your arsenal will make all your other attacks from daily diva and reverse daily diva better. Because now, no matter what grip configuration you use, collar and sleeve, double street, double sleeve, elbow and belt, whatever, your partner now has to think about the omoplata. When they're thinking about those other things, the opportunities for the techniques that you want will present themselves. Every technique in Jiu-Jitsu has a setup, an entry, and a finish. We just spent a lot of time going over the best way to enter the omoplata position. Now, when we get to that standard omoplata position, when I have his shoulder controlled and I have the grips that I want, I want to control that position before I attack and submit. Now, the obvious goal, we're always working inevitably toward the submission. The omoplata is a shoulder lock where I hyper-rotate my opponent's shoulder. There are three different types of joint locks in Jiu-Jitsu. Hyper-extension, an arm bar, we make the arm go too straight. Hyper-rotation, like a Kimura or an omoplata, where we rotate the joint beyond its flexibility. And hyper-compression, which is a slicer, and we'll show one of those uh, later on. But the classic omoplata submission is the shoulder lock. So I'm going to show you the ideal finish for when we have our partner flattened out, his posture broken, and his base destroyed, and then we can finish at our leisure, and then we'll work on what happens when we can't destroy our opponent's posture. So however I get into the omoplata position, maybe I get into it from the closed guard, where you bow, or from the lasso guard, however I get into it, right? Get into the omoplata. Grab his elbow, grab the pants. Step on the mat, hip away, extend out. I'm going to chop to get up, have my elbow on his hip. Now if Eric tries to get up, really, really hard. I'm using my knee to pin his shoulder to the mat. That's really important. We're going to work on some solo drills to get this position, but um, this is the ideal omoplata position. Now all I do, and we've discussed this a couple times, the main detail here is we don't want to lift our hips too much because we've done really good work to flatten our partner's hips out. We want to keep his hips flat. So whatever shoulder I'm attacking, I want to act like I'm going to whisper in the ear by that shoulder. And you notice that I don't raise my hips as much because that might let him get his base back. So that's our classic omoplata finish. The beautiful thing about flattening that person out first is now all of his traditional defense options, uh, posturing up, rolling over his shoulder, uh, stepping over my head, all of which we'll address later, are not available to him. So we're going to flatten him out and then finish. So we always want to attempt to flatten our partner out just so that we defeat the defenses before they happen. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But sometimes you have an opponent whose posture is too good, whose base is too strong, and we're not able to flatten. 
we're still able to finish the Oma Plata, and I'm going to show you how to do it now. So I enter the Oma Plata, however I get there, lasso guard today. I get my grips that I want, and I try, but I'm unable to flatten Eric out. Now the main thing that we want to avoid here, and where I think most of the mistakes come in, is we don't want to just kind of try to sit up. Because if I try to sit up, I need to have Eric's hip blocked. And so what most people will try to do is just sit up really quickly and block the hip. The problem is this becomes a race. And in jiu-jitsu, we don't ever want our moves to be attribute dependent. I always want to assume my partner is younger, stronger, faster, and able to react with more athletic acumen than I have. And so I want to put structural advantages in place. So if I just try and Eric's going to look to his left and roll over his right shoulder, I'm going to race him and I'm going to try to block his hip before he does that. Right. Now there are definitely things that we can do from here. And later on in the DVD, we're going to get into what I call topside control and controlling map position, but that comes later. If we can avoid having to deal with the defense at all, that's what we really want to do. So instead of just trying to sit up, we're going to have a couple of strategies for blocking the hip. Now, again, one thing that I, I want us to, to continue to try to do is chop with this leg because that gives us momentum, and instead of me just trying to get up with my core, it's like the whole weight of my body coming up, and that can enable us to sit up quickly enough. So sometimes you're able to sit up quickly and get the hip blocked before your partner can roll. If you can do that, awesome. But here's another strategy for getting there. So I have my standard grips. Grip on the elbow, grip on the pants. I'm going to transfer. I'm going to pinch my knees tight to make sure his elbow doesn't escape. Another theme I want you to remember, we don't want his elbow to escape or else we've lost the only plata. I come and grab his belt. Before I sit up, I'm going to switch my belt grip, belt to belt. One hand on the belt, two hands on the belt. Now, chop up and sit up. And now, as you can see, even though Eric, I wasn't able to disrupt his base, all I'm going to do is the same thing. My knee and my mouth are going to head toward his ear. And I hyper-rotate his shoulder joint. Shoulder joint still hyper-rotates, even though he's not flattened out. So one more time, let's rotate this way. If I'm down here, I gotta get up here to block my partner's hips before he rolls. So either I have to be very quick or I have to time it exactly right. You know, if this is possible, cool. It's not always possible. So instead, I don't want his elbow to escape. I have to pinch my knees to make sure his elbow doesn't escape. And I grab his belt. This is gonna stop him from rolling. Then I transfer to this hand. My elbow drops by his hip, so now if Eric tries to roll, it's going to be much harder. Now I sit up. Now I'm it. My legs make an S in the sort of pigeon pose that we, that we do for the omoplata. My knee's pinning his shoulder. My knee's going to drop down toward his ear. As I get up, rotate his hip. So a couple of themes. Like, so concepts. Jiu-Jitsu techniques are made up of concepts and details. The concept I want you to remember most while finishing is we always want to break his posture and base because we don't want to deal with any of the problems that him having posture and base give us. He can defend in a lot of ways. If we just prevent that, no worries. We've got the finish. The other concept is we always want structure in place. Structure allows me to move and movement allows me to create better structures. So if I just try to leap from one structure to another, right, like I have the leg, the pants leg, and I try to like leap up to the shoulder or to the hip, I might get it and I might not. If I don't get it, now I'm dealing with all sorts of other problems. So we're gonna go belt to belt, sit up, and then stop. Uh, then stop our opponent from defending and then finish from the omoplata, even if we can't flatten it out. The wrist lock is a submission that's almost always present in the omoplata position. Sometimes our partner is gonna be able to hide their hand and we're not able to fold the wrist. But if we move through omoplata positions, like we're trying to finish and our partner defends in a certain way, sometimes that wrist is going to come out. I want you to think of it as a target of opportunity. So if you see the wrist exposed, don't hesitate to take the quick hitter finish. This is also true because sometimes some of his defenses, like rolling or like posturing up, will allow him to defend one move while exposing the other. Anytime that hand is available, we're going to wrist lock. That's why I'm showing this wrist lock a little bit early in the instructional, and I'm going to point out as we go through the defeating the defense various times when the hand could be, pull, could be pulled out that we could wrist lock. So before I actually show it, I'm just going to illustrate a concept, which is when we attack a joint, generally speaking, we want to control the joint above the joint. 
So when we're attacking an armbar, we want to have the shoulder control so that we can attack the elbow and hyperextend it. When we attack a wrist, we want to make sure that the elbow is controlled. So if I try to, if I just try to wrist lock Eric, right? Eric, don't let me wrist lock you. Really easy. His elbow moves. If I control his elbow, tap, right? No worries. In the omoplata, we have his elbow trapped, right? And so as soon as his wrist is exposed, then we're going to be able to get him. So simply put, let me just get you in the omoplata from here. So if Eric's, so remember, we're not going to ever let go of our fundamentals here. Our, we're either, either with the triangle or with our stomp. We are keeping his shoulder pinned down. But if the wrist is just exposed, all I do is control the elbow, hold it for the tap, right? Now, sometimes the guy is going to try to grab the inside of his thigh, right? And now it's hidden. No worries. We just go through our standard omoplata finishing sequence, either flattening him out for the omoplata or exposing it. If I'm unable to get this, I can sit up and just start working the same shoulder lock. One thing that I'll show, and I'll point this out later when we do the defeating the defense, if Eric goes through certain defense procedures, like maybe I let off on this pressure, and a lot of times the big strong guy is going to try and posture up strong and look at the ceiling, a lot of times his wrist is going to come out when he does that, and I can get him. I've gotten really big guys with this, and it feels really awesome to get a really big guy with a tiny wrist lock. If he's hiding his wrist again, but he rolls, a lot of times we come up right into the wrist lock because the wrist is exposed. As long as I have this elbow controlled, I have the wrist lock. Now, once again, as a little bit of a preview, if he rolls and gets his elbow out, now I've got nothing. And now I have to do something else, which we'll talk about later. It's not a very complicated submission. Isolate the elbow and fold the wrist in a gooseneck position. The reason that I think it's an important one for the omoplata is if we're able to threaten this wrist lock, then you're going to get a lot of tough guys that you wouldn't otherwise get because they're so focused on you not hyper-rotating their shoulder or switching off to an arm lock that they'll let their hand come become exposed for the wrist lock, the only submission other than the omoplata that matters. So let's say we get to the standard omoplata position and we're having a tough time either breaking our opponent's posture or isolating the shoulder and his wrist hasn't come out. We can transition from that turtle type position to a straight arm lock that's really powerful and really fast and we can isolate our opponent in a bad position just using that straight arm lock. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to show it from this angle first just so you can see my knee position. So if I get Eric in the omoplata, sometimes he's going to hug the inside of his leg, right? And let's say I've come up and I'm blocking, and I can't get his, his shoulder, I can't get his hand to come out, so I can't wrist lock. I can't get his shoulder to rotate, so I can't omoplata. The key transition here, we're gonna to transition to a straight arm lock. So this is one of those where it's kind of a, a, a feel thing at first, where you have to feel where to get the arm lock, which is why our hand position is important. But the main thing that I'm gonna look for is my knee position here. So when I transition, I'm gonna do a little shrimp. You see how my knee is pointed to the ceiling? My knee is going to drop into the hole where his belly is exposed, between his belly and his thigh. So I'm going to grab for his wrist, drop my knee. So one more time, knee drops. As my knee drops, I'm grabbing his wrist here and my near side leg, my far side leg to him, my near side leg to the camera, comes over and hooks behind his butt. When I hook behind his butt, I'm able to extend my hips, pull his arm out. I like to give him a bro handshake here, like I grab his thumb so I can keep his thumb pointed in the direction I want. I hug this to my hips and I gently extend my hips down to the tap. This is also, like I'm not going to have Eric roll yet, but if Eric rolls, he's also going to stay in this armbar position. Um, my pinching of my heel and my butt should keep him here long enough for me to finish, but if he's able to roll, we're still going to be able to finish. So I'm going to show it one more time from this angle and then from a different angle. Because the, the really important thing is my knee has to drop from on top of his back into this hole right here, otherwise I'm never going to be able to get the correct angle. So, come to the wrist, drop the knee. Heel comes back, extend his arm out. Get the bro handshake. The reason that we do this sort of grip is that it's a straight arm lock. So, a shoulder lock is a bit more forgiving in that we're just trying to rotate this one joint. But if, I, if his arm starts to bend, then I'm not going to be able to straight arm lock him. So, I want to keep it so that, uh, it, so that the arm hyperextends. And now all I'm going to do is soft my hips and my partner taps. So let's show it one more time, this time facing the camera. 
So I'm here, right? I would love to omoplata. I would love to bend his shoulder. Can't really do that. I'm having a tough time. Uh, having a tough time pinning his shoulder. Having a tough time extracting his hand so I can't wrist lock. Grab the wrist. Drop the knee. Heel comes back. Pinches behind his butt. As I pinch him behind his butt, I very gently drop the hips forward for the tap. This is one of those submissions where um, we've had, we always have a check down list, right? If we could submit everybody first time, we would. But this check down list is, okay, could I flatten him out? If yes, I'll just finish the omoplata. If I couldn't finish flatten him out, let's try and finish from that turtle position omoplata. Okay, I couldn't do that either. Okay, I can't, what about his wrist? Is his wrist exposed? If it's not, okay, now I'm gonna go to the arm lock. The reason that this is sort of an option that's down on the checklist for me is I like personally to keep people trapped in the omoplata web so that no matter what they do to escape, they end up back in that omoplata position. This is one where we'll bail the omoplata position to try to finish a relatively high percentage arm mark. We always wanna finish the omoplata perfectly, right? That's why the first thing we show in the instructional is we get to the classic standard omoplata position, we flatten our partner out, and we finish. It doesn't always work that way, but it doesn't always have to work that way. So I don't want you to think that the only way you're able to, get to finish an omoplata is you get your legs in this position and do this. That's the way we drill it, because we want it to drill it perfectly. And if you drill a move perfectly that has 15 details in a situation which is stressful and you only hit 10 details, you still finish. But if I show you a move that has three details and you miss one of them, then it's gonna be difficult to finish the move. The reason I mention this is we always wanna maintain that understanding of what the core goal is. The core goal is we hyper-rotate their shoulder. We make their shoulder bend in the wrong way as we rotate it the wrong way. It's very common that when I get into my opponent into an omoplata position, that my opponent tries to stop me from getting into what they think the omoplata position is supposed to look like. In this case, he's gonna grab the leg that doesn't come in front of their face. This happens all the time. But it's a very easy uh, defense to defeat, so much so that I don't really think that it's a, it's a, it's a very good defense. So, if I get the omoplata, right? I want to set it up from the open guard. So open guard, control the distance, um, get my knees inside, I'm controlling the inside space. Kick my legs straight, boom, get to the omoplata. A lot of times my buddies, like once I get here, I, I have them in a lot of trouble, right? But you see what Eric's doing with his left hand? He's grabbing my knee. And people will do this gi and no gi. They're like, okay, I know Jeff wants to sit his hips out and flatten them. And now, if I, I can't. I can't pull my leg out. Now, patience is really important in jiu-jitsu. And so sometimes, and this is why I like going station to station in jiu-jitsu positions. Because if I'm not in any trouble, he's working harder than I am, and I'm in no danger, then I'm not really going to worry about advancing my position too much. This one though, I don't need this leg to finish. All I need to do is hyper-rotate his shoulder. So what I'm gonna try to do, if you see my pelvis is perpendicular to the ground, it's kind of pointed away, I'm just gonna try to point my pelvis at the ground. In order to do that, get up on my elbow, and I'm just gonna rotate, rotate, right? So you can see that Eric was holding my leg that whole time. All I'm trying to do, and I'm gonna do it without Eric's shoulder in there so that I don't injure him, all I'm trying to do is this. And you can see with his shoulder in there tight, I'm going to be able to finish. So, um, I'm going to show that two more times. One, the, well, go ahead and let me, oh, I'm sorry, no, no problem, just let me do the entry. So, like, I'm going to do the entry, right? We want to finish it the classic way, and I'm not going to flatten him. But, you know, all the cool images of Omoplata have us here. And so sometimes people think, you know what, he's got his leg in front of my face, but he really needs to get that around. All right? All I'm going to do... Another detail that I didn't mention but is important is this leg is always stomping down to pin his shoulder. And I'm just gonna yeah. rotate, right? If Eric rolls here, one thing he has to let go, that, but you see how he's still in a position where I'm always gonna be able to hyper-rotate his shoulder. So, a couple of takeaways from that. Um, you don't have to be in the classic omoplata position to finish the shoulder lock. This is also what leads us into things like monoplatas. Um, which we're not going to cover in this instructional, but there's plenty of good instructionals out there on that. Um, you just have to isolate that shoulder and hyper-rotate it. So second takeaway is, if you were trying to defend the omoplata by just grabbing their leg, you need to pick another defense. And we'll go over those defenses and how to defeat them in the next couple of sessions. 
Another way to finish the omoplata involves taking my foot and putting it under his far armpit or even his far knee if he stands. Now, why would I do this? There are a couple of reasons. For one thing, it prevents my partner from rolling, but more commonly, certain omoplata setups and, you know, just the act of grappling is two human beings moving in dynamic positions. Sometimes I don't end up in the classic omoplata position. When I'm trying to omoplata, I'm trying to end up looking the same direction as my partner is, right? Where I'm parallel to him. But sometimes I'm going to end up more on my side, and that's going to create an opportunity for me to feed my leg under his armpit. This commonly happens when my partner stands. So if I do the entry from the daily heave guard, where I have the daily heave hook, I have the collar, and I have the sleeve, I'm going to extend him out, make him post, come up, on the plot to bring him down. So you see how I'm kind of on my side here, instead of being straight up to with him like this. This isn't bad. What this does is this creates an opportunity for me to triangle my legs, and this foot is going to feed under Eric's far armpit. You notice that like I instinctively am controlling his elbow because once again, if the elbow slides out, we've lost it. I make a triangle and extend the bottom of the triangle. This is actually really useful because once again, if he tries to roll, it's going to be very difficult. If Eric remained standing, a lot of guys will also feed this foot under his knee, which is a really savage finish. Andre Galvao is amazing at that. Um, I haven't had a lot of success with it just because of the length of my legs, but this one works, especially if, if, our, if our partner comes down like this. So the finish is just a little bit different. A lot of people teach it where you extend your legs out. Huh. And that can definitely work. What I prefer is I come up and I start to butt scoot away, which is a lot worse, right here. Yeah. And not only that, it allows me to not extend my legs. When I extend my legs, my legs are weaker. So I'm gonna show that finish one more time and then show the entry to it one more time. So, I come up and bring my butt underneath him. I'm facing directly perpendicular to him. I can't extend my legs to finish, right? Because that's the way that I get pressure on his shoulder. But I'm just going to do a little butt scoop. And my partner taps. So, let's do the entry and the finish one more time. Just because um, because I want to show it from, from this angle. So I have my collar and I have my sleeve. I have my daily Evo. I'm going to push him back. Come up. And you see how you can already tell I may end up on my side. Now, if Eric's able to stand, a lot of folks will feed this under this far knee. Like I said, you can see I have stubby little legs, but like, that's pretty terrible, right? Yep, yep. So long-legged folks, you know, try that one. What I try to do is I always try to stomp down to break his posture because I have a lot more luck feeding it under the far shoulder. And you see Eric's about to tap already. I don't want to respect that. So I'll scoop my butt in. And then just bring my butt the gently back tap, and my partner taps. The advantage to this one, really difficult, like there are a couple of advantages to this one. We don't have to worry about changing our body position. We can just stay in that sort of off angle. And when we get our shoulder under his armpit, he, he's not able to roll. So a couple of advantages to this one, try it, play around with it. If he is able to roll, and often because we're not in the classic omoplata position, he may roll before we can get that foot in. That's the type of stuff we're going to cover next when we cover how to defeat the most common defenses to the omoplata. Now we get into how to defeat some of the most common defenses. Probably the most common defense, depending on skill level, is people will turn their face to the outside and roll over their inside shoulder. Everybody wants to roll when they first get caught in the omoplata, and this is not a wrong impulse. If he can't bring his shoulder back to his body to protect it, he can roll to bring his body back to his shoulder to avoid it being hyper-rotated. Now this isn't wrong, and one of the, the reasons that I think a lot of people think of the omoplata just as a sweep instead of a submission system is this is pretty effective for people, and so people get out of the web. For the rest of the instructional, we're going to learn about how to keep him trapped in the omoplata web, so we replata and just bring him back there, but it's also really important to learn how to give up and how to get off the sinking ship and how to admit, okay, our partner has done an escape and now we're going to take that escape and flow to a powerful position. For me, the trigger is if he's able to roll and extract his elbow, then that's when I have to come up and take side control. Another reason that I might do this technique is if I'm down on points in a jiu-jitsu tournament and I really need to go from the bottom to the top and just come up and take side control. I might choose to give up the elbow and take the points and control side control. Whether 
it's a decision that you make strategically or whether it's something that they force you to do, it's important to learn how to come up in transition and control side control. The only reason you should feel forced to do this is if his elbow leaves, uh, if his elbow comes out from between your legs. So we're going to talk about that now. Let's actually let me just give you a name of the plot, right? So right now I have control of Eric's elbow. His elbow, elbow hasn't escaped my hip line or my knee line. So I would be able to control the roll if he were able to roll. But when he rolls, if the elbow comes out, now I can't control it anymore. So I'm just going to come up, put my hand near his hip, and my arm comes to his far side. I want my sternum basically in line with his sternum and my body at 45 degrees away from him. So now if Eric tries to bridge, I'm able to stay with him. If Eric tries to shrimp, I just follow him with my hand. I've come up and taken side control. And from here, I can work a really powerful position. So now, let's do it one more time with me on the camera side. So you see how I have control of his elbow. When Eric starts to roll, if I lose control of the elbow, it comes and breaks this line right here. Uh-oh. I have to come up and block his hip because I don't want him to shrimp. And I have to come with my arm on the far side. And now, no matter if he walks from one side or another, I'm able to follow him easily and start working my side control game. At this point, he's escaped the omoplata, which is not what I wanted at first. But it's really important in jiu-jitsu to learn not to hold on to a sinking ship and to admit, okay, the battle for this position is lost, and now the battle for another position begins. The other thing I'll tell you is, this is a win, and it's a win that most jiu-jitsu practitioners will likely take, right? A lot of people use the omoplata just to sweep. If you have a choice between being on your back in the guard and being on top and side control, you're almost always going to take on top and side control. So if that elbow escapes from between your legs, that's what you have to do. What we'll do next is learn how to control that elbow so that doesn't happen and we continue to keep him in the old plot of that. So the next position we go over is going to be really important. We're going to call it topside control because it's when my partner rolls out of my own plot of, but I'm able to come to the top and maintain control while remaining in the position where I can replot and get back to the own plot of position. Topside control is really important because it allows us to solidify the position without Eric getting away, and we can continue to hunt the omoplata as well all, as all of the other submissions, as well as a couple of new submissions that I'm going to show you from the topside control position. The first thing to understand is the most common reason we find ourselves in this position is we didn't block the hip. Either we didn't sit up fast enough or we lost control. If we have our elbow blocking their hip, it's really rare that they're going to be able to roll, and when they do, we have some other options that I'll show you next. So, if I get Eric into the omoplata, I want to make sure that I control the elbow. In this case, remember our standard omoplata position is my outside hand controls the elbow, my inside hand controls um, the pants. If I have this and Eric tries to roll, it's going to be really, really hard. So usually when he's able to roll, it's because maybe he caught me in transition. So the reason that I mention this is, if I feel him being able to roll, instead of my outside hand controlling the elbow, my inside hand is going to control the elbow. And as he rolls, I'm going to do this all, at, 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 we're going to break it down into a couple of different positions next. But for now, I'm just going to show you the full roll up where I follow him. So Eric rolls, now I'm going to follow him and I come up, putting my knees under him and maintaining control of the elbow. The reason that I control his elbow with my inside hand is so that I can post with my outside hand to help myself come up if I need to. So this is what we're going to call topside control. Now, we're going to break it down and demonstrate exactly why this is such a powerful position. So I get into it, right? Maybe I just got to the omoplata, I'm going for my grips, and before I go for my grips, Eric rolls. Immediately, I transfer to, to this elbow control. And now, you notice how I'm not in topside control yet? Eric, I'm going to ask you to turn into me. Eric, I'm going to ask you to try to get away from me. We have a lot of control here just from the elbow grip. Now, if we lose the elbow, Right? Then we have to go to side control, the way we did before. But you see how his elbow still hasn't crested my knee line? As long as that hasn't happened, he can't get away. This is not as powerful as topside control, but it's still powerful enough to hold Eric. So to get to topside control, I'm going to post my hand, come to my knees. Now, it's doubly powerful, because instead of just my hand controlling Eric's elbow and stopping him from turning in, now Eric's elbow has to go through my hand and the entirety of my thigh controlling. And so, once again, Eric, try and turn into me. Try and get away from me. Okay. You won't always watch. I'll go over some details for this too. We can also hit wrist locks and transition, but we'll, we'll go over that in a second. So 
this is the topside control position, and we're gonna work from here a couple of times during this. But here's the thing, I always want you to remember that you have the option to replot it. All I do to replot it is I'm gonna turn my head away from Eric, and my near side shoulder is the one I'm gonna roll over. When I do that, that's gonna put pressure on Eric's shoulder that's gonna force him to follow me. So I post with my outside hand, look toward my outside hand, and I roll right back to the omoplata position. Again, what's the difference? Why didn't this work the first time? It was, was when Eric's elbow escaped. And so let's turn this way. You can make this a drill where Eric looks away and rolls, follow him, come right up to topside control. The reason we want to make this a drill is we want it to be smooth like that, right? Where I come up and I'm, in my, I'm on my knees immediately, just in this position, which minimizes the chances of his elbow getting away. But as we demonstrated first, if I end up here, right, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of the world if I, if I let go of his elbow. If I'm here, I just kind of come up. Look to one side, look to the outside, push to the outside, roll over that shoulder inside, and replot it. So now, I'm going to show it one more time, but I'm going to show it when this time Eric is going to get his elbow. So if Eric goes to roll, and I come up, now he's able to free his elbow. I no longer have topside control. I have to come to side control. Right? But if we get topside control, we're always able to get him into that replot position. I talk about islands of safety in a sea of danger, and how I define that is if I can attack my opponent, but they can't attack me, if they're working harder than I am, and if I have a little bit of time to make decisions, that's an island of safety. That's a hub. Topside control is a hub. At that point, we have the ability to decide whether we want to replot up, whether we want to come up and take side control for the points, whether we want to go for another submission, which we'll go over in a second, and all of those options are available to us at topside control. So definitely spend some time getting used to this role. Usually if our partner is able to roll, it's because I haven't been quick enough or I haven't made a good enough transition to block his hip. Blocking his hip is a really effective strategy for stopping him from rolling. But speaking as someone that's a smaller person, um, often, especially if you're the person that your opponent is bigger or if your opponent is very flexible, even if you have that elbow blocking that far side hip in the turtle, sometimes they're going to be able to roll. That's the bad news. The good news is when they do that, we can catch them with an alternative finish that we're going to call Space Mountain. I'll explain why we're calling it Space Mountain after I show the technique. But it's a really effective technique, one I've been doing for years, and something that we can catch in various other positions that I'll mention throughout the instruction. So, the way this differs, right? So I get Eric in the omoplata position, and right now, if, if I were just, please don't roll Eric, but like Eric, there's nothing stopping him from rolling, right? Don't have a block on his hip. But sometimes you get up to this position, and here, you have this elbow, right? And you know, I have, I'm set up to finish, but a lot of times if the guy is much bigger than you, or if he's very flexible here, he's gonna be able to tuck his head and roll. So here's the thing, I'm gonna roll with him, and as I do, I'm gonna catch his bicep under the forearm. So this submission is also available to you when he postures up hard, which we'll mention later. Anytime he leaves that arm behind, we're gonna be able to catch it. The reason that we caught it here is because I already had my elbow here blocking his hip, right? So it's very easy for me to catch this bicep. So I just cup his bicep. Now it's very important that my elbow comes behind Eric's back. The reason for that is if it's not behind Eric's back, Eric can push back onto me and kind of smush me. And so, you know, at best for me that ends up in a stalemate and not in a finish, and plus I'm carrying his weight, which is unfortunate. So instead, I put my elbow behind his back. The elbow goes behind his back for two reasons. First, to prevent that. Second, it's gonna help us finish the submission. All I do to finish the submission, if I have the triangle locked, I'm going to unlock the triangle and step on the mat, and all I'm going to do is gently strip my hips away. When you're drilling this at home, be careful because it comes on really fast. Again, that submission is available from various other positions as well, but let's have it from this angle. So, the reason that we're able to catch that from this is, you know, the, the first technique he just rolled because we missed blocking this hip, right? But in this situation, I'm like, hey, I'm doing everything right. I'm blocking your hip. However, a lot of times, guys with physical abilities, you're just going to be able to roll. So we're going to roll with him, but because my elbow is in that position, I catch the bicep. It's also available if you're just in the omoplata position and he leaves it behind. This elbow can't stay in front or he's going to smash you, so the elbow comes behind. Step on the mat, and I'm bridging away. I'm shrimping away while my knee turns slightly down. Back, 
my partner taps. Very, very powerful shoulder lock. We're going to return to Space Mountain a couple other times in it. So I'm going to explain why it's called Space Mountain. I've been doing this technique for years. I learned it from Michael Lange, uh, but I've seen a bunch of other people do it, so I didn't want to call it the Michael Lange technique so other people do it too. The first version of this technique was called the Blood Eagle because I watched Vikings, and I was like, if any of you have seen Vikings, you'll know why it's called the Blood Eagle. If you don't, don't Google it. My wife was horrified that I would name it after a Viking torture technique, and so I said, you know, it's kind of like I'm strapping him into a amusement park ride like Space Mountain. And so we call the Space Mountain as an homage to Ric Flair. So regardless of what we call it, it's a very powerful control position. It's also a really powerful submission. So pay attention to those details. I think you'll catch that a lot. And we'll show you how to catch it in another situation later in the instruction. So usually when I get to topside control after my opponent rolls, my first option is to re-roll right back into the old plot and keep them trapped in that web of submission. But sometimes the strategic situation means you want to take a different option. So there is an option to take a type of mount here called rodeo mount, where, and also attack a mounted triangle. So sometimes in a jiu-jitsu match, maybe you need a submission, maybe your partner has defended the omoplata well, maybe you just want to go to mount for the points. Either way, there's an option to go to the mount from here with a back step. So the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to get Eric in the omoplata. I'm always controlling the elbow, right? So as he rolls, I'm going to roll with him, come up to topside control. Now again, if I wanted to, generally my first option is to keep him in the web and replot. But I still have this arm trapped, so I can post and backstep. Now when I backstep, I have the option to just continue to the mount and take the points for the mount. But instead what I'm going to do, I might show that later on, but I want to attack immediately for the submission. So I'm going to post my outside hand and grab his head. Then my leg comes underneath. I return to controlling his arm, post out this way, lock my legs, finish the mount of triangle. I'll show that one more option with the option to take the mount. I'll show a few of the details on finishing the mount of triangle too, and we'll show it from a different angle. So my partner rolls. I come up and follow them to topside control. For whatever reason, I don't want to take the replot up. I'm going to back step. If I want the points, I can just continue to full mount. Right? Just a question of the strategic situation. So let's, uh, let's do it with you facing this way. So I, I got the old plot. Awesome. My opponent rolls. Not awesome. I come up to topside control. Awesome. I decide not to replot. I'm going to post and back step. Lift his head. Knee on the mat. Angle out. You don't actually have to lock the triangle to finish the mount of triangle here. You can just pinch your knees together and squeeze. His arm is also available to you for the finish. If you choose, two hands on the mat, right to the mat. Call it rodeo mount because of the back step. It's kind of a cool transition. And it's always important to have more options in your arsenal. I think that the most high percentage technique there is just to continue to the omoplata and replata, keep them trapped in the web. And that's why we want to, that's the focus of this instructional too, just to finish from the omoplata wherever. But sometimes you're going to need four points. Sometimes your opponent has proven tough to finish with the omoplata and you want to go want to take a different option. So this is a really strong additional option from the omoplata. Jiu Jitsu is a game of transitions. And sometimes when you're in those transitions, you can transition to another type of submission system. We just saw how you can transition from the omoplata to the rodeo mount, enter the mounted triangle system. And because it's 2020 and every jiu-jitsu instructional has to have some leg locks on it, there is a way we can use the omoplata roll to enter into a leg lock position and attack a knee bar and a toe hold to enter that system as well. This is particularly useful in nogi, where it's much more of a transition-based game. So if I get Eric into the omoplata position, right, and either because I didn't block his hip or he was too quick, he decides to roll. Instead of, I'll tell you when to roll in a sec, instead of me following, I'm still going to follow him up. But instead of me trying to follow him up to topside control in the replot, my outside hand, in this case my right hand, is going to catch his leg just above the knee. So as he rolls, I'm going to come with him, and I catch. Transfer my hand, post, scoop, enter the knee bar position. To finish the knee bar, I pinch my heel tight to my butt, pinch my knees together. I'm going to use my head uh, on his toes, like I'm trying to use his toes as a pillow. Push down on his heel to compress and very gently extend forward for the knee bar. There's also the toe hold here available as well. And those of you that do 
leg locks very regularly, we'll see entries to various other leg lock positions in there as well. So I'm going to show that transition one more time, and then maybe show it on the other side. So um, let's actually show it straight on this time, and then we'll show it again from that same angle. So I get Eric in the omoplata. Either I messed up, or he was really on point, and he decides to roll. I follow him up and grab his leg. Post, scooped, hook. A few knee bar finishing details. When I cast my leg out, I pinch my heel in tight, and I pinch my knees together. The reason that I have my head on his toes, using his foot as a pillow, is that one of Eric's defenses would be to turn his toes to the ceiling, and he can't really do that because I'm turning him the opposite way. The knee bar is a compression lock. Instead of, unlike an arm bar, uh, the knee bar, uh, we want to compress the joint instead of extending the joint out, so that's why I put my hand on his heel, push it down to attack the meniscus, and very gently back tip in until my partner taps. We have the toe hold, and we'll be doing a different toe hold later in the instructional where we'll go over that. I just want you to be aware that the toe hold is there as well. So let's show it one more time from this angle. And once again, the, the, the principles, uh, you know, even though we're transitioning away from the omoplata system here, the principles are the same, right? We find our hub. And whatever hub our partner lets us take most easily is the one we should go to. Sometimes we're gonna to wanna to fight to keep him in the omoplata, and I'm gonna re-roll and re-roll and re-roll and keep him trapped in the omoplata until I get it. That's my A game, so that's what I typically do. But if maybe he's proven to have really stout defense, or maybe your A game is leg locks, then using this as an entry to get into the game that you more prefer to play is also an option. So Eric's gonna look left and roll, I'm gonna come up with him, catch, scoop, cast, into the leg lock. One of the reasons I like Omoplata so much is that when we isolate one body part of the shoulder and force him to pay attention to it, now all these other submissions open up. Wrist locks, slicers, which we'll get into a bit later, arm bars, and of course the leg locks as well. When we get to the Omoplata position, my first option is always to control the position, to control the elbow and control the leg so that he can't posture up, so that he can't roll, so that he can't step over my head. But sometimes that doesn't work out. Usually, his first option is to roll over his near side shoulder. But sometimes, if I'm not quick enough to grab that leg and block it, to walk that leg away from me and roll either over his far side shoulder or try to get on his side. So, that looks like this. It's actually a really effective escape. So, if I get Eric into the omoplata, right, what I want to do is control here and control here. But if Eric knows this, he's going to walk his legs away from me and start to roll over his far side shoulder like he's getting on his side. Now, he can come up and start to pass. Freeze his elbow, bad for me, right? That's his first option, really effective escape. So my option, when I have my standard omoplata grips, my outside hand controlling the elbow and I reach to control the pants, but I feel him walking away, my option is switch my elbow control to my inside and overcompensate my weight to the right hip. So now if he tries to roll, where am I? right back into topside control, right? And we know what to do from here. We have replatas, all that stuff. So the reason that the first move failed for me is that he was able to defeat my control of his leg, and when he defeated my control of his leg, he was able to use that roll to get the elbow out. So it's really important that I switch my hands at that point, control the elbow, and overcompensate my weight to one side. One more time. So, if I, I'm not going to have Eric do it successfully again. So when I feel, so I'm going for my standard grips, outside control, inside control. Either maybe Eric breaks these grips or I just never get it and he walks his feet away. When he does that, immediately I'm going to come to the inside control and drop my hip to the mat. So now, Eric's no longer able to roll and come up into a position that's going to be advantageous for him to pass. Instead, if he tries to roll, we're right back into my top side control. Right? That's what I want to do, is I want to shut off his avenue for escape, especially if he's able to come up into a passing position. Once we're in topside control, we're going to show a couple other techniques that we can control from here. Most people, particularly less experienced people, are going to roll over that inside shoulder. But a lot of savvy folks are going to walk their feet away and try to roll either over their far side shoulder or even put their knee under me and get on their side. So, for every job, there is a perfect tool, and what we're going to do next is we're going to figure out how to defend each of those jobs using the right tool. A slightly different technique that is a slightly different angle is when my partner doesn't roll over his near side shoulder or his far side shoulder, but tries to roll to his side. 
When he puts his knee underneath me and tries to get on his side, he can often free that elbow from my control. So instead, what I have to do is I have to go to the far side to keep him trapped in the omoplata whip. Looks like this. So once again, I'm going for my standard grips, right? I've got my outside control and I've got my leg control. A lot of times, especially a bigger person, even if I have these grips, is going to be able to, and we're going to show Eric execute this successfully first, he's going to sit to his far hip and bring his knee underneath me. And now, when he gets his elbow out, we're kind of in a scramble, right? And scrambling is gambling. I don't really want to do it, especially because my jiu-jitsu is really station to station. I want to be able to control the position. So if he does this, it's a pretty effective escape. So what I need to do is I need to switch my control of his elbow and I need to follow him to the far side. So the minute I get the inkling he might do this, so I have my standard grips, right? And you see that like sometimes even the standard grips are not a great answer for this against the big guy because he just kind of like mongo rolls to his left. So what I'm gonna do when I get the inkling he's gonna do this, as he starts to bring his knee toward me and sit, I control his elbow with my near side. That allows me to post to my outside and now go. As he goes, he's gonna sit on top of him, right? Now immediately, I'm already in a better position. And you can even sometimes go to the mount here, but what I prefer to do, switch to the far side. You can catch Space Mountain here in transition, or we're right back into the replot of position. Anytime my partner leaves their arm behind, we're gonna look for Space Mountain. It's a really powerful finish, as well as it's just a really powerful control position. But worst case scenario for me, if Eric doesn't let me do that, right back into the omoplata web, working to finish the way we did before. So again, the key is the elbow. If Eric's able to roll to his butt and free the elbow, I'm in trouble. So that's why I transfer outside control to inside control. And when he rolls, I go with him. Whereas when he rolls over his near side shoulder, I'm rolling straight. When he rolls over his far side shoulder, I have a different answer, going up to top side control. If he just rolls on his side, I have to roll to that side with him, going to the far side, and then keeping him trapped in the omoplata web. Jiu-Jitsu solves most of life's problems. What solves most problems in Jiu-Jitsu? Posture. Most submissions, like triangles and yes, omoplatas, can be solved if my partner has perfect posture. That's why we put so much emphasis on preventing them from making posture. We break them down with our standard omoplata grips before they can make posture. We stomp down either with the triangle or with our two feet to prevent them from ever getting posture. And that takes care of a lot of problems with the omoplata because if he can make posture, he can stop me from hyper-rotating his shoulder. But things happen, right? Maybe we mess up, maybe our opponent is really big. And so I'm going to show one of my favorite ways to break down the posture after we've failed to flatten him out and after we've maybe failed to get as much pressure on the shoulder as we want. So if I get Eric into the only block. So when I talk about posture, right? So I have my standard grips and usually, and let's, let's give you one more detail on prevention. So with prevention, whether I triangle my legs and press down or whether I just stomp down, Eric's gonna have a tough time making posture. If he's a really big, strong guy, I will extend my legs and cross. So now if Eric tries to make posture, not only am I putting pressure on his leg, he's also carrying my weight at the end of the lever. The thing is, people get caught in transition. And so often, what guys are gonna do is they're gonna posture up powerfully. And you're gonna feel like you're gonna get thrown like a lawn dart. This has happened to me a lot. This is one of the situations where I think it's really important for me to triangle my legs. Because if he shucks me off, like if I don't have my legs triangle and he kind of shucks me, now his elbow comes out and I'm in real trouble. And I'm in a scramble. So when you feel him start to posture, you should triangle your legs. So posture apart. Another thing I want to mention is that when he postures apart, often his hand is going to come out. Remember, we're always looking for wrist locks yeah. as targets of opportunity. And believe me, there is nothing that feels better in this life than having a 280-pound man, not Eric, but I have done this to a 280-pound man who beasts you up and you just go whoop and wrist lock him. There is no better feeling in this world. It is unbelievable. However, we don't want to count on that. So the first option that I'm going to show is how we break down his posture. I'll show another option when he postures up like that later that I've started doing as well. I'm going to reach with both my hands for his far side lapel. If I can get it all the way out, I'm going to pull it. One of the things I like to do to start jiu-jitsu matches is just swat their lapels out, especially good for lapel guard players, but I also like to use the gi to tie them up for gi or agami. So I try and get their lapel out when I can. When I get their lapel out, my mat side hand, in this case my left hand, is going to come as close to his armpit as I can, and I'm going to wrap my elbow behind. 
I'm going to step on the mat and break his posture down. This is really useful, especially if I can't get Space Mountain because he's going to be hiding his elbow from me. So I'm going to show this one more time and show it from a different angle. So in this case, so the posture's up hard. I try to my legs to not get thrown off. Two hands come to the lapel. I'm pulling it out. I want to get my grip as close as I can to his armpit, and I want it thumb down. My elbow comes behind, and I step. Break the posture, come up, and finish. Let's show this posture break from a different angle. So this time, Eric's going to be closest to the camera. So I'm ready to finish, but I mess up, and in transition, I let him make posture. As he makes posture, I have to try with my legs so I don't get thrown like a lawn dart. That's happened to me too. Don't let this happen to you. Two hands come over. Pull the lapel up. Mat side hand is going to come as close to the armpit as I can make it. Thumb down. Elbow comes behind. Make a brace. Take him down. Finish. So remember, we didn't want to get here. Uh, what we wanted was to flatten him out before he even got to the turtle position. When he got to the turtle position, we wanted to use our stomp or our triangle to pin his shoulder. If he tried, if he's still able to make posture, we can extend our legs with them crossed to make it really difficult. But jujitsu is all about situations where littler people take on much bigger people. And so sometimes you're going to do everything right. Now, nobody does everything right all the time. But sometimes you're going to either mess up or you're going to do everything right and somebody's still going to be able to posture out of your own plot. Lock the triangle, get the lapel, shrimp away from them, break their posture, and then we can get into our finishes. So we wanted to prevent our opponent from making posture, but we were unable to. Our opponent postures up really hard. Now usually, when they do this, they're going to have to exert some energy, right? Because they're lifting your entire body off the mat, hanging off of their shoulder. So the last technique and this technique have one thing in common, which is I'm still going to try on my legs. But for this technique, I'm going to actually take that momentum and do a backward roll where I'm going to end up in the top side control position that we started out in a couple of, a couple of, of techniques ago. And then we're going to work from there. Remember, once we're in top side control, we're able to replot and get back into the omoplata position and also attack a few submissions. So when your partner does this, they're usually going to lift you up pretty high and at that point, you're just going to do a backward roll, the same way we do when we warm up for jiu-jitsu class. So if Eric gets me in this position, right, and I have my grips I want, but I'm unable to, to stop him from posturing. Now, Eric postures up hard, and all I'm going to do is move my head to the outside and roll over the inside shoulder. So when Eric postures up, it's very simple and really easy. When our opponent makes a, a dynamic movement, we can either try to resist it, which gets us tired and often has problems anyway, or we can go with that dynamic movement. As long as I have this elbow control, I'm not worried about it. So you notice I have the outside elbow control and I'm able to go right to the position with my knees under his shoulder for topside control. So I'm gonna show this again, we can make this a flow if we want to, where I control his elbow, post to the outside, replata, Eric is going to posture up, I'm going to switch elbow control, come right back to the top side control position. The one detail that I want to mention is when I replot, I want my inside hand controlling his elbow so I can post and roll. When he starts to beast up, I want to switch that and control with the outside hand so that my inside hand can guide myself through the back roll and also set up a submission that we'll talk about in the next video. So once I have this, and I decide I want to replot him, switch my grip, post, right back into the position where we can come up and start to finish. Josh Murdoch showed me that backward roll for a long time when people would posture up hard. All I would try to do was wrist lock them. And that was fun and gratifying. But this is a really efficient way to get us right back to that top side control on the plata position. And when we're in that top side control position, it's a hub for a whole lot of attacks where we can re-enter the old plot of web, go to the mount, or attack a couple of submissions, which we'll talk about next. So that top side control on plot of position that we've been working on is a hub. And when I say hub, I want you to think about the hub of a wheel. The hub is the central point, and the spokes go out from there. So that gives us options, right? When we're in a hub, we can select the options that we want. 
And so from the top side control position, we have the option to replot up, keeping him in the, in the omoplata system. We have the option to go for space mountain. We have the option to backstep to rodeo mount. We have all these different options. Other options that are available to us are actually submissions from the top control position itself. One of which we've talked about and made reference to, which is the wrist lock, which is always available if his hand is exposed. And I want to show you that from top side control, but I also want to show you another option as well, which is a compression lock, and it's a slicer. I mentioned before that all jujitsu techniques, all jujitsu uh, joint locks rather, uh, are basically in three categories. Hyperextension, the arm bar, the straight foot lock, hyperrotation, the kimura, the omoplata, where we over-rotate, and hypercompression. So what a slicer is, is I put a block into his joint, and I overly compress the joint until I damage it or my partner taps. That's what a slicer is. Be sure that the slicer is legal at your belt level before you try it, because it's also something that can get you disqualified, but uh, wrist locks are always worth two points, so go for the wrist lock first. So, two style points, not two jujitsu points. So, let's say we're gonna do the backward roll, and Eric's gonna, and I'm gonna go to topside control. So Eric postures up hard. When I do my backward roll, end up in topside. Now, what I could do, you know, from here again, we're in our hub. We can, Reroll the own plot, backstep, whatever. The first option that I want to do is I want to go for the wrist lock. So I'm going to transfer my control here, and if his wrist is available, I just gooseneck it until my buddy taps. Whenever the wrist is there, it's available. So here's the thing. Often he'll either be able to hide his hand, or maybe he grips with both hands, whatever. Maybe I can't get to it. I'm going to change my position and go for a slicer. So to post on his far, um, his far shoulder, and bring my shin. Now that's a block. Sometimes you can get the tap just by rolling your pass forward, right? But what I prefer to do is bring my hand in, and now I can guide yeah. it to control it a little bit more. If you can't see, what I'm doing is I'm bringing the small part of my leg, which in this case is the lower part of my shin right by the Achilles tendon, in and making a block with his elbow. Then I'm coming here, and I'm rocking using my hips. Yeah and my hand to guide the slicer. Now, I love low risk positions, and this is sort of the definition of it, because what can Eric do here? The only thing Eric can do really to defeat the position is to escape his elbow. And if he escapes his elbow, pulls it out, we're right into side control. Now, again, strategic situations are a little, you know, strategic considerations are always gonna be there in Jiu Jitsu. If you're in a submission only match, it's definitely the type of thing that you wanna go for, right? Or, if you're down on points, you need a submission, we can go for the slicer. The other thing that we want to consider, right, is like, what is our risk reward ratio? If I get to that top side control position, and in the middle of a long match or I'm down on points, it's really useful for me to just be in a control position. Either I stay in top side, re-roll to the omoplata, back step to the mount. But if you're looking for a submission, uh, the wrist lock and the slicer are available from that top side control position. So we've covered some of the common defenses. My opponent rolls, whether it be over his near side shoulder, far side shoulder, or tries to roll to his side. We've covered when my opponent tries to posture. We want to prevent all these things, but we have some cures for them. The last thing, and it's something that has caused me problems over the years, one of the things I would least rather my opponent do, is when my opponent tries to step over my head. This is why I try to get that pants grip on top right away, or if it's nogi, I try to cup on top of his, uh, of his calf. Because when they step over the head, and we'll have Eric step over the head and show you the problems that it can create, what started as a good attack for you can end up in a guard pass for the other guy, which happened to me in a tournament at Brownlow. So I resolved to try to defeat this. So if I get the own plot, and I'm getting ready to do my stuff and set and finish, if Eric is able to step over my head, now I'm stuck. And if he's able to pull that elbow out, and now he just back steps with his right leg, he can either even stay here and like, you know, he can come to, he can pass to either side. So it's a problem, right? I no longer have a functional guard. However, so we know how to defeat this, right? Ideally, right, hands either cup on top of the calf or grip the pants. And so now if Eric tries to step over the head, it's actually not possible. And actually by trying to step over the head when I have this grip, he makes it much easier for me to flatten it out. So if you get this, it's a serious prevention against a really, really dangerous technique. So come back. But, you know, jujitsu is often a transition game, right? And so maybe I have this and I'm going for the pants when he tries to step over my head. My option now is to catch his toes. 
I call this the toe plata because I love puns. So it's called a toe hold, right? Not a foot hold. So I don't want to grab his ankle, I want to grab right at the toes. My arms come over and I connect the figure four. So here's the thing, what I don't want to do, well, I'll show you what I do want to do and then what I don't want to do. I want to pinch my elbows in tight and try to fold his pinky toe toward his heel. Yep. Toe holds are about heels, heel hooks are about toes. We'll go into that at another time. What I don't want to do, so Eric comes, he tries to step over, I grab the toes, right? What I do not want to do is try to take his toes to his butt. A lot of people teach this as a finish, and the problem with it, see how Eric's not tapping and he tapped super quick before? Where are my elbows? My elbows are not tight to my body. I'm strong here. Here, I'm extending and I'm weak. Also, when I extend his toes toward his butt, see how his knee is bending? That's not what I want. A toe hold attacks this part of the foot, and so if his knee is able to bend, just in the same way that if I try to wrist lock him with his elbow moves, it's not going to have the same kind of pressure. So instead, I want to have his, his, I want to attack the submission in my own workspace. If I go here, it's out of my workspace. So see where my elbows are? I pull them in tight, and I'm just gonna rev like I'm doing reverse on a motorcycle. Yeah. So something that's, so here, if I try to finish it here, I'm using all these large muscles and it's not working. But if I try to finish it here, very, very simple to finish. Let's see that from another angle. So let's look at the camera. So again, and let, let's show what happens when Eric successfully executes this, right? And sometimes, like, Eric, what Eric did was step over and go basically north-south. So go ahead and step over. I'm stuck. It's really bad. He can even take this leg and bring it to the same side that his right leg is. Also really bad. You see how his el my elbow, or his elbow, naturally escapes when he does that? So we're going to come back on this side. So all of this is very bad for me, right? And this is one of those submissions where I don't really care even if his knee ends up on my belly because the submission will come on very fast. So Eric tries to come over, grab his toes, come over and grab. So check it out. I'm going to do it wrong the first time, then do it right. If I push it toward his butt, it's probably never going to tap. My elbows come in tight, and I just do a little rotate. My, my, my wrists roll forward like I'm trying to reverse rev a motorcycle. Yeah. And I do a little ab crunch, but I need a little extra juice to finish. So, one of the beautiful things about getting someone, I've used the analogy of getting someone trapped in a web throughout this instructional series. The way I feel about it is, if you have someone on your ground, you will always have the advantage. And they can escape and escape and escape and use energy and use good technique. If they're unable to escape the web of things you do best, you will always be able to have an advantage in winning the long run. And so sometimes that's gonna come on as a quick submission, like a toe hold or a wrist lock. Sometimes it's gonna be a, you might have gotten away on the first three rolls, but on the fourth one, I caught you. And so that's what we wanna trap him in the position and then take advantages of submissions of opportunity. As I mentioned, when my partner steps over my head, it's one of my least favorite problems to deal with. So always want to be emphasizing prevention. You know, if you can cut the calf, grab the pants, stop that from happening, you save yourself a world of hurt. If you're able to catch the toes in transition, absolutely finish them with that toe. But sometimes your partner is going to be good at this, they're going to have drilled their own transitions, and they are going to step over your head and come to that sort of straddling mock north-south position that Eric was in earlier. I'm going to show you a technique where we can get back to the replata from there. And it's relatively simple, but also high percentage. So, let's do it from this angle first. I get Eric into the only plot. I got my one grip, I'm going for my other, and he steps over my head. I miss. Ah, crap. So here's what I have to do. I'm going to have to let go of the elbow for this one, just briefly, because I'm going to pinch my knees together and extend. And I'm, it's really rare in jiu-jitsu that you want to go flat, but I'm going to go flat, and I'm just going to log. Where am I? I'm right back into the topside control position, right? So now, I go and replot it. So go ahead and come back, and we're going to make a flow out of it. Come back to your knees. Just so we can show this from a different angle as well. So Eric's going to step over my head, controlling the elbow. Pitch my knees really tight. Extend my legs out, and walk. Come up, recontrol the elbow. Replot it. Back into the elbow plot. Let's show it one last time. So Eric steps over. If I have the triangle, I have to give up the triangle now because this is going to require me to roll flat. Step, extend my legs, roll, come up to the replot position, hit him with the wrist lock. 
relatively simple technique and a timing based one, but also something that is an option. Now we don't ever want to get here, right? Let's prevent this, please. Do not let them do this to you. If they do, however, the key to this technique is to pinch your knees together because the minute that elbow comes out from between your legs, we have to do something else in transition. But if you can keep that elbow pinched between your knees, then rolling flat, log rolling, and coming up to the top side control position for the replot is your best option. So y'all, we don't ever want them to step over our head. We have many options that we got to, that we want to exercise before we get to this point. We want to get our grip so he can't step over at all. If he tries to step over, we want to toe hold him. If he does step over, we want to limit him to stepping over with only one leg so that we can do the log roll escape. If he gets both legs to the other side, that's when I have to grip outside his pants and I have to pinch my knees together uh, to make sure his elbow doesn't escape. And then I'm going to re-enter the omoplata. So, if I get into the omoplata, I'm controlling. Now Eric's going to hop over with both knees. Immediately, I'm going to pinch my legs together. You see how I'm pinching my legs together? The reason I did that is I have to give up his, um, I have to give up uh, my hand controlling his elbow. So my knees have to be what controls his elbow. And my two hands come to the outside of his knees. And if I can, I'm going to move his knees to the far side and just re-enter the elbow plot. If I can't, I'm going to come right up to top side control and re-roll with it. Now, usually, this is a timing-based move. We're going to show it one more time. I want to make sure that I do this before two things happen. I want to make sure he doesn't get to settle his base, and I want to make sure he doesn't control my head. If he settles his base and controls my head, then we have to bail and just start recovering guard. But the reason that I'm able to lift him with my two hands on his knees is that I'm extending with my pinched legs, which brings him off his base just enough for me to move him. So let's do this one more time from this angle. So I'm here, right? Eric's going to step over both of my head. Immediately, I'm going to transition and control his knees. My knees are pinching together. I extend my legs, either bring him back. If I'm unable to, like maybe I can't bring him back, I'm going to extend my legs, push the other way, come up top to top side control, right back into whatever Roma plot of finish you have. Every technique has an opportune moment. And some of these techniques are more timing based than others. This is one where it's very timing based. If your partner is able to settle their base and control your head, it's gonna be a bad position for you. So just as he has to, just like Jiu Jitsu is sometimes a game of beating your partner in transition, which is why it's important to drill. When you drill the move, you don't think about the move when you're rolling or sparring or, or competing in a tournament. And so, if he beats me to the punch, like I wanted to grip his, his leg, but he stepped over my head. I wanted to toe hold him, but he got there first. For this, we have to be able to stop him before he settles his base. If he settles his base and controls our head, then it's time to start escaping. But if we're able to catch him at the right moment, it's an opportunity to keep him trapped in the Oma Plata web and keep doing what we want to do. Hey y'all, having good solo drills that you can do on your own is really important. Jiu Jitsu is all about partnership and community, but we all have times when we're going to be alone and we're going to be able we're going to want to be able to work on our techniques by ourselves. I got started teaching Jiu Jitsu, teaching at a 6 a.m. class, that sometimes it would be me and one other person, sometimes it would be me and five other people, a lot of times it would be just me. So I started developing a lot of solo drills. And there are a lot of solo drills that we can do that are going to help us both warm up before Jiu Jitsu class, but are also going to get our joints more flexible in ways that are going to make the omoplata easier. I'm going to show you four of them. So the first one, and I like to warm up with this for about a minute at a time before jiu-jitsu class, you can do it as long as it feels good, is just a hip opener. I'm gonna have my hips parallel with my feet, and post my hands. I'm gonna rotate until my knee goes into the sole of my foot. Obviously, we're never forcing anything, so if it starts to feel like you're gonna injure yourself, go a little slower, don't go as deep. Always start slow, right? So what this does, so you can probably see that it's a good drill for hip flexibility. It also just feels really good because in jiu-jitsu we use our hips so much that, you know, we're all going to have the hips of an aging golden retriever if we don't take care of them. So this is the kind of thing that helps me warm up before jiu-jitsu class and also gets me into that S position that we're going to use a lot to finish the only plot. So I just call that the hip opener. Another drill that's going to help, not just with the only plot, but with other parts of jiu-jitsu, you'll see what part of the only plot that it that it, that it helps with as well, I call the get up drill. So I'm gonna have one leg posted and one leg flat. I'm gonna get up 
and, and my hips are going to come forward with my belt knot. So I'm going to use my heel to kick myself in the butt. And my belt knot comes forward. Switch to the other side. Kick my heel in the butt. Belt knot comes forward. Some people, depending on your body type, will need to post at first to come up. That's okay if that's what your physiology demands at this point. But I really want you to try to just come up using your core strength. It's going to build your core. It's going to build your flexibility. And it's going to build your, your, your muscle memory. So that the way this mostly applies in the omoplata is you see how we get up when we roll uh, to follow them to topside control. right? My partner rolls. If I'm in a seated position where I'm just about to try to omoplata and they come up, very important I'd be able to come up and follow them. So if you are having to post your hand, the little technique that I've mentioned before, so you see how my heel is out here? In order to generate momentum and help myself get up without like rolling right over my leg, I just use my heel to kick myself in the butt, generating momentum and coming up. On the other side, it looks like this. It's going to help you with your get-ups to topside control. And so when, if you imagine my partner is here and my partner rolls, now I'm here ready to control the top position for the omoplata. So a third drill that I really like to do are pigeon pose side switches. If you do yoga, you know why I call this pigeon pose is that this, you know, they're, they're a pose is, a, is a variation of the, the pose that yoga folks call pigeon pose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into this pose on one side, post my hands, and switch. So I post my outside hand and switch into the same pose on the other side. For most of these drills, I will set a clock for a minute and I will do this for one minute. You, you'll note that all, for all these, I'm doing them on both sides. Right? It's really important to uh, both, you know, it's important to have an A game side, but it's also really important to be uh, ambidextrous with it. So that if your partner exposes one side, that you're able to attack it. So another solo drill that we can do is a pendulum get up. You'll notice that when I get up for the omoplata, I'm using my outside leg to chop down. If I'm on my back and I try to get up, cool, I'm doing a sit-up. And sit-ups are great, you should do a lot of them. It'll build your core strength. But if you want to be efficient with it and you want to be quick with it, you use your outside leg to get up. So I start on my back, my sole of my foot goes to the ceiling like I'm lying on Richie dancing on the ceiling, and I chop and come up. I switch sides, go flat on my back. Put the sole of my foot toward the ceiling, chop and get up. You can go all the way to the get up position with this one. Chop and get up. Switch sides, whoops, chop and get up. So that's another solo drill that you can work in. So those are some drills that should help both with the omoplata and also your conditioning, your flexibility, and warming up for jujitsu class generally. Like I mentioned, part of the reason I think everybody should do the omoplata is it teaches really important lessons about how to move our hips and how to transition between positions. And hopefully these solo drills help you with that. Okay folks, the techniques I've shown today are part of my omoplata system. This is the majority of what I do day in and day out, rolling in the academy and in tournaments. It's stuff that's time tested for me, something that works really well for me. And I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've gotten something out of it. So every instructor does things slightly differently. You can show you can ask 10 black belts to show an arm bar. You'll see 10 different arm bars, and they'll all be correct. Two really good instructors that I've gotten the chance to work with, both of whom I've had out to my academy for seminars, are Jay Quitfield, who's one of my primary instructors and a black belt under Hoist Gracie, and Josh Murdoch, who's an active black belt competitor, very successful, and a part of the legendary Murdoch Brothers. So both of those guys are very successful with Omoplata, and both of them do it slightly differently than I do. So what I really want for y'all is, as you're building your game, to be able to see techniques that work, but work very differently for different folks with different body types with different experience levels. And so I've asked both Jake and Josh to contribute some videos to this compendium, and hopefully you get something out of those videos as well. I know I've learned a lot from those two instructors, so thanks Jake and Josh for being willing to shoot some videos for us, and here's their omoplata systems. Hey guys, Jake Whitfield here with uh, Travis Wheeler, my black belt student, and we're gonna add a few omoplata things in. Uh, Jeff sent me like a 12 page manifest of everything he's teaching so you guys are going to get a lot of good stuff already but I'm going to show you some things that I do that are maybe like a little bit different than what I've seen other people doing and hopefully it doesn't overlap too much with what Jeff's showing. So the first thing I actually want to show is I actually want to show how I escape omoplata because I give the omoplata a lot 
when I'm in bad situations, when my posture has kind of been compromised or when I'm feeling vulnerable, I give the omoplata because I'm really confident in my omoplata escape. And then that feeds into how I do omoplata on the bottom is mainly trying to avoid the escape that I do on the top. So if Travis lays down and he gets me in the omoplata, my arm is over, he brings the leg around. As soon as I get to this position, I'm always looking to put my head on the mat and then all I try to do is I just try to do almost like a little cartwheel or like a little jump up and over the top, bringing the hand underneath the head so that he can't roll back underneath me and now I just work my arm out. Okay, so one more time, Travis catches the omoplata and as soon as we get here, I post on my head and I turn my shoulder so there's not too much pressure and then I just kick up and over the top. Now at this point, this hand has to come in front of his face to prevent him from rolling back underneath me. Okay. And now a lot of times I'm able to get a complete pass out of that. So I have a ton of success with that escape. Do it to almost everyone that goes from a plot on me. And so when I'm on the bottom, my main thought is preventing the other person from doing that type of an escape to me. So now on the bottom, my main entry for omoplata is actually like doing an arm bar, but I'm not trying to do the arm bar. I'm trying to go for the omoplata, right? So everybody knows basic arm bar, you control the arm, foot on the hip, one, two. If he pulls the arm out, then I have omoplata, okay? But a lot of times I do the same body motion without even thinking about the arm bar. So Travis and I are rolling, we have whatever grips that we have, and I go ahead and I clear this arm out, and now I make the turn, and I don't even worry about this arm, I don't even control it. And now I bring the leg around, and I push with the leg to get to this position. Now as soon as I get to the, this position, I don't want him to do that little jump over the top. So I control his belt. This belt grip, or no gi, I hold the back, but if he's got the gi on, I'm gonna hold the belt. This is one of my biggest concerns because holding that belt makes it much, much harder for him to jump over the top. And so I'm gonna get the belt and I'm gonna turn my elbow outwards so that I'm controlling his hip, okay? And now I lock. When I get to omoplata position, I'm not in a big hurry to finish the omoplata. And honestly, finishing the omoplata as a submission is, in my opinion, not a super high percentage goal, right? So I'm going to get the omoplata submission, maybe like, depending on the level of person I'm training with, like maybe 30% of the time, okay? More than likely, it's going to be a sweep or it's going to be a transition to something else, okay? But so if I'm right here and he can't jump across, now as I start to sit up, his only option is to do the forward roll escape. So if he does the forward roll escape, I'm not concerned by that because now I'm just gonna get on top, okay? From here, I can put the elbow over the head and just finish across the side or, let's back a little bit here. So I'm here, boom. I lock my triangle, and now as I start to sit up and he rolls, I'm gonna keep my triangle, I'm gonna put my knee on the floor. So he comes up and he rolls, and I have the knee on the floor. Okay, from here, like I said, I can go to the side control position. I always, when I get to this position, I check a couple quick and easy things right here. I check the wrist lock, boom, if the wrist lock's there, then it's done. I check the straight arm lock, I control the wrist, and I fold it across my thigh, okay? What almost always happens is at this point the person comes over and they grab. 
When they come over and they grab, I unlock my triangle, hold the wrist, wrap the arm, and I come to the Kimura position on the top. Okay, And now the Kimura game is a really strong game for me, and I've got this locked up and ready to go. Okay, So that's kind of my thought process on the more or less the standard omoplata. So let's go through that again. So I go ahead and I make sure that I'm inside of this arm because now when my body comes around, I'm going to be ready to clear that. Okay. So I'm here. I turn, I push the head and force the arm out. Now I catch the omoplata position. I hold the belt and I open my elbow out. Start to sit up. If he rolls, see I keep my calf underneath the tricep. I can check the wrist lock. I can check the straight arm lock. If he comes over to grab, I hold his wrist, wrap, and now I have a nice Kimura position right here. So that's what I do off like the standard omoplata. One thing that I do that I don't see very many people doing is I, I a lot of times will hit a different angle on the omoplata itself, which I feel like gives me more control. Okay, so when I get to omoplata position and I get here, a lot of times guys will hold the inside of their thigh because now it's very hard for me to sit up. Okay, and so for the first thing I'm going to check when this happens is I'm going to check with this foot, can I hook something over there? Right now, Travis has two knees on the floor. So I'm going to take my foot, I'm going to bring it underneath his face and in his armpit right here. Okay, and now I stretch my legs and pop that arm out. Okay, and from here I have an arm lock in this position. If so he's holding his thigh. If he posts his right leg up, now it gives more pressure this way. So it's harder to get up. So now I'm going to check and see if I can put my foot under his thigh on that side over there and catch his leg. Okay. Now from here, I just rotate a little bit. Okay. But sometimes... I'm here and the, I, can't, I can't get that in. Maybe he's controlling my foot or whatever it is right here. Okay. There is a foot lock you have to be careful of right here. My, my feet are pretty flexible, so it's not an issue for me. But if Travis puts his head under my ankle and bends my foot, it's almost like a toe hold. Okay. And I don't usually get caught in that. But, you know, if you're not very flexible and you're just doing this thing as a hobby, that might be a danger for you. Okay, so I'm here, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the opposite angle. So normally on omoplata, we're going legs this way, but this defense holding the thigh makes it very hard to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unlock, and I'm going to drop my knee inside this hole. So I unlock, and I put my knee down. And now I relock. And what this does is it gives me a ton of leverage, not against his arm, but against his arm pit. Okay? It's very hard for him to take his arm out of here right now. Okay? But also it allows me to push him in a direction that he's not expecting. Now I can climb my way up and I can still finish the omoplata. Normally on omoplata, the knee is here. This time it's on the inside, but I can still sit forward and finish right there. So let's turn a little bit to the side here. Now I'll come over this way. So I have Travis's arm and he's holding his thigh. I tried to fish with my foot over here and he's not letting me do it. 
So I unlock for a second, I scoop my hip out, I drop my knee on the inside, and I relock. Okay? Now from here, I'm just going to use my legs and push him this way so that I can get up, scoop my hip out, and start to come up. Okay? <clears throat> One other option that I use from this position is that if I'm here, I scoop my hip out, I drop my knee on the inside. From this position, I can also take this foot, this top foot, through the middle right here and put it across. Now I start trying to bring his arm out and I catch an arm bar right here, okay? So here, I drop my knee inside, okay? And now I feel like for whatever reason I can't get up, I can take the top leg and put it through that hole and go all the way across his hip. Now I stretch his arm and get the arm bar. If he rolls, then, hold on one second. So if I'm here and my knee is up and he rolls, then I'm doing the things that I showed before, putting the knee on the floor, checking the, the wrist lock and the arm bar. But if I drop my knee on the inside and he rolls, then when he rolls, he's going to roll right into this arm bar position. Okay? And that's uh, also a very good no gi control because my entire body is wrapped around just one arm which makes it very hard for him to get out okay so there's a little bit of my omoplata game not the whole omoplata game because like I said Jeff has 27 pages of omoplata for you guys but that's some things that I do differently that maybe uh, you wouldn't see somewhere else because I didn't really learn it from anywhere I just kind of discovered it from training. Okay? Thanks, guys. All right, guys. So I'm going to show you the Omoplata from the Open Card. He grabs my pants, so I need to defend myself. I bring my feet around and I make sure I make some tension into his biceps. Now I can start to get some control of the situation. So I cut my angle, I grab deep into his collar, and then I grab his sleeve. As I grab my sleeve, I'm gonna turn his wrist up and kick my foot off into no man's land. This is gonna give me a nice pull on the sleeve and a nice push on this collar to help me really stop on the bicep and reach my leg all the way up. From here, I can keep punching him away while I have this nice bite, and then I can put my foot right over his head. This is gonna allow me to set up this control position, which we're gonna talk about in a second. He grabs the inside, now I have to defend myself. So, over and chop. Now I switch my angle to start gaining control. Sleeve and collar, I kick my foot off as I turn his wrist up. I stomp and I reach. Now I can punch him away so he doesn't look at me while I go collect his head and keep his body under control. Now one more time, a little bit faster. All right, guys, we find ourselves in the closed guard, and our objective is to home plot them. Okay, so I've defended myself enough that I've got myself to the closed guard. So objective one is complete. Now let's start to get control of the situation. So I'm gonna lift my hips up, and on the way down, I'm gonna slide these hands right underneath, and I'm gonna glue her hands to the floor. All I'm doing is controlling her elbows and putting a little bit of weight on there so I have this nice little swivel. Okay, now just like a hip bump, Kimura sweep or just a Kimura setup, I'm gonna bring myself all the way over so I can control her shoulder and I can try to flare out her elbow. Okay, so I can be super fun with it and I can bring myself all the way up and clamp my elbow onto her shoulder while I control her elbow with both hands. Okay, 
Another way that I can bring myself up here, since we've had our hands down and we're already controlling, is I can just swing myself up, okay? Easy peasy. Now I'm gonna bring her down with me. So I can open up, scoot away, and start bringing my knees up as I clamp everything down. Okay, now I use my elbow to control this wrist, and I use my other elbow over here to make sure that she doesn't look at me. I want to make sure she doesn't look at me so that she doesn't come back to guard. Okay, now I can weasel my knee out. Now my knee is making sure that she doesn't look at me. This is going to help me start to break her down into my own plot of position. So, one, two. Now I have her shoulder and I have her elbow and I can use this elbow to help push that wrist back into place. Now we are in the Jay-Z CJ position. This is where our guard is. This is where we're gonna make our attacks, okay? This is when I know that I've controlled the situation and now I can attack her. Defend, control, and then attack. I spread my legs out to control her posture and to control her legs. I don't want her walking over my head, which is gonna happen if this is really lazy, okay? Now, I also don't want her to start standing up and anything that happens with that is gonna be controlled with this chop right down here, okay? My hand may or may not be on her collar right now, so that means this leg has to do all of the work. This is how I'm gonna control the position. Okay, so now we're in this position. We've woken up here. Whether we uh, entered from open guard or closed guard, I want to make sure that I control her posture with my leg over her head. If she was to stand all the way up, she's going to be able to rip her arm right out of here. My own plot of position is going to fail. Okay? So, I want to make sure that as I keep her down or as I have her down, that I clamp this head and make her look at the floor. This other leg is gonna be very important because I need to make sure she doesn't jump over my head. If she was to walk her legs over one by one, I'm gonna get smushed and I'm gonna get passed. Oh, what's up guys? <laughs> All right, so we found ourselves in the Jay-Z CJ position, okay? Now she has two options and this is the whole reason we're stopping here. All right, she can start to posture all the way up, okay? Now, if she postures up, this arm's gonna go away and I'm gonna lose, okay? So, once we get in here, bam, bam. I need to make sure that I control her head with this leg. If I'm not controlling her head with this leg, what's gonna happen? She's gonna stand up and she's gonna get this arm all the way out, just like we should, okay? So, The other leg, the other leg is very important because she could just start to walk over my head. Okay, one leg at a time. One, and then two. Okay, now I could be eating cross face and now I'm gonna get smushed. I'm gonna have to recover my guard and start all over again. So once we get here, one, and then two. We gotta make sure that we control the head and we control the body. I can keep my heels away from each other in order to make sure that they stay nice and strong. And I wanna make sure I'm doing leg curls on the back of her head and leg curls on the back of her waist, okay? This arm is punching into the hip. If I had the elbow before, this is a really good time to move down to the wrist to make sure that it's pushed into my pocket as far as possible. Now, this hand has an opportunity to create a choke. If my hand started on this far collar, as long as it's inside my leg at the time I get to the position, I'm able to finish right away just by pulling my arm all the way through. If I find myself in this position like I should, I put my hand all the way through here and reach, and then again I get to look for the submission, okay? That can be very difficult because we're working on an omoplata. To stop, go back, and find a choke is going to need them to open up the opportunity. If they're trying to beast mode their posture up through this leg, this is a really good time to reach that hand through and start to pull for our choke. But now, let's start to work on our finish. 
we're gonna go back to that more familiar omoplata position. And I wanna make sure that my hand controls the collar that's closest to me. I'm gonna start to push her wrist in and I'm gonna walk my legs over. I wanna make treat her shoulder like the thing in Indiana Jones. I gotta make sure I trade off the control. So as my leg comes off her head, my other leg follows and starts to chop all the way down. I chop all the way down until I can bring myself up. From here, remember, if those legs get over me, she's gonna pass my guard and I'm gonna get squished. So this hand has to come over and start to control her far collar. This is my primary mode for control because I can start to pull this all the way out. And now I don't need the collar anymore. I can trade my hand across and staple it down to her back. Now, all I have left to do is to get her knee on the floor and her hip to touch the floor. If this happens, there's a really good chance that I get the finish right away. So I can grab her ankle and start to scoot my butt away. Knees pinched, scooting away. Once she falls down, now I can control her legs and bring my body up. Feet away, and I bring my body up. As you can see, it's already very tight. So I'm gonna let her arms slide out. And I wanna bring my hips all the way up, and I want her hand to clap the floor all the way over there. I want them high five on the floor. Let's start moving into the attack. I'm gonna bring my hand back to her collar, and I'm gonna make sure that I can trade this leg off for this arm. So I can grab over her belt and then clamp down on her shoulder, okay? This is gonna let me scoot myself up and bring my hand all the way to her far lapel. Now my hand is take, job is taken over by this leg. This is what's gonna allow me to start scooting away. As I'm scooting away, I wanna open up this lapel as much as I can. If I can get this all the way up and use a thumbs up grip, to clamp down her shoulder, it's gonna be really easy for the finish. I bring my hand to the ankle, I scoo myself away, and I break down her posture all the way to the floor. I need to control her whole chest to make this happen. In order to control her chest, what's the closest thing to the chest is the hips, all right? So I control the hips, I've controlled her back, I've controlled her chest, now I can start to sit up with my hips. I want her hand to clap the floor all the way where her other hand is. So if I have to, I can bring it all the way up here and bam, belly flop on the floor. So that's my old plot system. I want to thank everybody who took the time to watch. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. I had a blast making this. I guarantee all of the stuff in this is stuff that I've done multiple times in competition, in roles, or on the academy, and so it's things that work really well for me, and I hope you have success with it too. If you have any questions about it, just contact me, Jeff at BellinghamBJJ.com, I'd be happy to help you troubleshoot it. No matter where you are in your jiu-jitsu, I really hope that you get something out of this, and I'd love to help in any way that I possibly can. Also want to thank Eric for taking the time. We spent a lot of time filming this DVD here at Bellingham BJJ and Bellingham Washington. Eric was a huge help and I'm really grateful uh, to everybody who helped with the production of it. So thank you all for watching. Go out and shoulder lock people. The Omoplata is a blast. If you're a person who has Omoplata for years but maybe gets one or two new setups out of this, I'm grateful. If you're a person who's never really understood why an Omoplata is something you should work into your game, Try these moves. Maybe you never become an Omoplata ace, but you still learn a little bit more about how it fits into your overall jiu-jitsu system. And so thanks for taking the time. Happy training. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you sometime.